Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is session number 69 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Very exciting because we might possibly get to Weathertop today. Uh, so we'll see about that. Uh, one quick announcement before, well two, two quick announcements uh, before we start. The first is just to remind you of our upcoming event with an imminent registration deadline, and that is Baymoot, Northern California folks. Uh, we're starting to get a, a good crowd at Baymoot. Looking forward to seeing people there. Um, the registration deadline, they were able to extend it to the 11th, so there's still a little bit more time. But I'm not going to be around to remind you next week uh, to uh, register. So uh, please remember to register for Baymoot uh, if you live in Northern California. Uh, so that's going to be awesome. So let's, uh, uh, let's definitely do that. Um, the other quick announcement is that I, as I already mentioned, I'm not going to be around next week. Uh, so, uh, I don't forget not to come, uh, next week we're going to have no class and then we're going to come back again, uh, the week after that for the return of our class as usual. And I should be home for a good long stretch, uh, at that point until, uh, possibly even October. So, Hey um, Corey. Yeah. I forgot to tell you I have an announcement. Okay, sure. <laughs> I wanted to let everybody know, um, especially any of you that watched Corey uh, roll a high elf. If you don't have a high elf yourself and you saw Corey roll a high elf, so you know the story of the high elf. Um, a week from this Thursday, which I believe is the 7th. Oh, gosh. Now I can't remember the date. A we're going to be the 9th. 9th. Okay, it's the 9th. We're going to be running a raid in what's called the Abyss of Mordath. Um, with a bunch of Mythgard kinnies, okay. and we're going to be uh, streaming it on Twitch. And the thing that's interesting about that is that some of the things that happen in the High Elf story gets resolved. So this uh, is a lore group. It's a lore raid. We're going to actually stop and pay attention to the lore in nice. the raid. Nice. Yes. Excellent. So Excellent. I just want to let folks know, uh, it's. Uh, I'll post it up somewhere. <laughs> Right. I'll post it in Discord. I'll post it in Discord for folks to give Good. them the time and everything. So I just want to let everybody know that. Because I realize you're not going to be here next week, so I better let people know now. Yeah, excellent. August 9th, sometime in the evening. <laughs> excellent. Thanks. Very good. I, I, uh, Thanks. I approve of lore raids. That's excellent. Yes, you approve. Of, this is a lore <laughs> raid approved by Corey Olson. That's okay. right. Thanks. Thanks for letting me cut in. Yeah, no problem. No problem. That's great. All right. Uh, so let's get back to, and yeah, so Druid's Fire, yeah, I think it'll be streamed. I, th I think that'll be streamed here. Uh, yeah, cool. All right. Uh, so let's, uh, so let's get back to the text here as we had, we've just talked about, um, we just talked about the poem last night, last night, last week, last time. Uh, so let's, um. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get back here and look at the reaction to, uh, to the poem. Well, actually, hang on. Before we get to the reaction, I do have one, um, uh, one thing that, uh, I got from the discussion board. Actually, there were several really good comments on the discussion board, but some of it relates to the discussion we're going to have tonight rather than the stuff we've already done. So I'm just going to save that and we'll talk about some of that stuff as we go. Um, but, uh, one really good thought from a, 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 a user called Old Tolkien Fan um, about the reason for uh, a Strider to go to Weathertop, which, of course, we've been talking about his decision to go to Weathertop. Uh, and uh, he says, I've always assumed the real reason for Strider's decision is the intercession of the Hand of Providence, which gave him the feeling that climbing Weathertop was the right thing to do, something he really had to do. Why, why was being on top of Weathertop insisted upon by Providence? It's hard to make an ironclad case, but I suspect that the whole quest would have failed had Frodo not been seen and then attacked and wounded at Weathertop in just the way that he was. The reason is that it was necessary that circumstances lead to the Black Rider's horses being destroyed at the ford. Without that, Frodo and company may have made it to Rivendell, but Rivendell would have been surrounded by the enemy. The Fellowship would have been trapped and would never have been able to leave on the next phase of the journey undetected. The forces of Sauron would eventually close in just as it was said that they would if the Fellowship returned to Rivendell after the failure at the Redhorn Pass. But by being wounded, Frodo was under the Ringwraith's power just enough to make him stop at the far side of the ford, which led to verbal back and forth with the Nazgul while their horses were foolishly standing in or near the river, waiting to be destroyed. 
Had Frodo not been wounded, he might have kept going and galloped across the ford at full speed with the Nazgul at his heels, who would have then passed beyond the river without incident. Alternatively, had Frodo not been wounded, then the Nazgul might have been less complacent, chasing him more aggressively through the wild, which could have led to a more disastrous result than what actually occurred, particularly if all nine closed in for the attack. I think this is a really interesting thought here. Um, So... Uh, a, a couple things that I would say. Um, this, there, there are a couple ways in which I'm a little bit resistant uh, to this line of thinking, but that's not what I want to start with, actually. What I want to start with here is this kind of smells right in a lot of ways. That is, this definitely has the feeling of the kind of thing that we see quite a bit uh, in Tolkien's work, of course. And that is when bad things which in fact appear to be disastrous turns to the story, right, turn out to be not only in the end beneficial, but in fact in the end uniquely calculated to bring success, where, you know, looking back on it, success would never have happened had not this, at the time, apparently disastrous thing occurred. That's something that we see quite a bit, right? Um, uh, the obvious examples, which I've made from The Hobbit many times, are, of course, almost every disastrous change of direction of the on their journey that happens turns out to have been uniquely favorable. And had they not had the disastrous thing happened, captured by goblins, wandered off the path in Mirkwood, whatever it is, um, they would have um, they would have died like they, 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 they would never have made it. Um, so that's. Uh, that's, as I say, a sort of a, definitely a general trend. What's more, we can see this often happening with bad decisions, right? When somebody makes a choice and it seems like the evidence would suggest that it was the wrong choice, right? Think about the, the way that Aragorn is beating himself up, up about what happens at, at, uh, at Rauros, right? Um, you know, you give the choice to an ill chooser and all that kind of thing, right? He 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 uh, does not think he has covered himself in glory as a leader of the company on that day. You know, he thinks that he's failed, uh, and yet the choices that he makes lead, like, and the the apparent disaster that has come from the breaking of the fellowship, the death, the the solitary death of well, it's almost solitary death of Boromir, the capture of the two hobbits, Frodo and Sam going off on their own without help or support. All of this stuff seems like I guess it's just like. A, like a complete train wreck, right? This is an utter disaster. But of course we know that this turns out to be the, like the uniquely favorable result, right? Had Mary and Pippin not been captured in particular, right? Then a whole series of events that were really necessary to have happened and without which uh, the, uh, the story could not have ended well. Um, would never have occurred, right? And now it's true. Uh, uh, several of you are talking about how yeah, both uh, both JJ and Mike are talking about um, uh, how hard it is to judge, you know, what might have happened uh, compared to what happened. And JJ specifically saying that no one has ever told what would have happened, uh, sprinkling sprinkling a little bit of Aslan uh, of Narnia's wisdom into there. Yes, that's true. Um, However, there, again, there are occasions uh, of this kind in The Hobbit with those examples that I was pointing out. It's the narrator who explicitly tells us what would have happened uh, had they continued down those uh, paths. Uh, with the, uh, the decisions of Aragorn at the Falls of Rauros, it's Gandalf who later tells Aragorn himself uh, not to regret the decisions that he made, right? Uh, and tells him not exactly what would have happened had they not made the choice, but rather shows him how this thing, which has seemed to be mere an unmitigated disaster, as far as they can tell, has in fact been not only not only has it turned out well, uh, but it has been uniquely uh, beneficial. Uh, so, as I say, on that level, what happens here at Weathertop? That like reading what happens at Weathertop this way feels right. Like it 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 fits. It harmonizes with the rest of the story. I've been suggesting, sometimes openly, sometimes less openly, that um, Strider's choice to go to Weathertop here is uh, ends up being fairly disastrous. Like, this is one of those decisions of Aragorn's, which seems to clearly turn out badly. He's we, he's explicitly laboring, right, trying to figure out whether they should go to Weathertop or shouldn't go to Weathertop. He decides they go to Weathertop, right, and when they go to Weathertop. Frodo's almost killed, right? And it looks like, you know, in retrospect, as we're going to see from Aragorn the next morning, in like a month and a half or whenever we get to the next morning, uh, 
Aragorn's comments the next morning will show that he's kicking himself, right? He's kicking himself about, you know, like, saying that, you know, in retrospect, that was totally the wrong call, right? And yet, um, I can definitely see old Tolkien fans point here that um, the way that this works out, it is true that the consequences of that decision, Frodo's injury, right? And the subsequent uh, dynamics of the pursuit with the ring wraiths. I think that that, you know, the, the, the connecting it specifically uh, to the Fords of Bruinen is interesting. Now I do agree uh, with Mike and JJ here that one, there are, there are two, well, I guess I would make sort of one objection and one qualification to this reading in particular. Uh, the objection that I'd make, I, I think the weakness of this reading is it does involve a, a long series of what ifs, which are not explicitly uh, uh, supported by the text. Again, in the way that, uh, you know, Gandalf supports the idea that Merry and Pippin getting captured was in fact, in the end, a good idea or rather resulted in a good thing. And, uh, and the way that the narrator comes in with that sort of obvious, that, that explicit affirmation in the Hobbit, we don't get anything like that here. Exactly. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, but, but it's not just that it's not like, you know, the narrator has to explicitly come out and say it in order for it to be true. Um, but as I say, th there is a, a long series of, of, you know, uh, what ifs and, and, and things which, uh, make this a little bit less direct than say the causal link between Merry and Pippin's abduction by the orcs and their meeting with Treebeard. Right. That's the argument that Gandalf makes. Right. The, the, the result of the, the immediate result of them getting captured by the orcs, which seemed like a catastrophe. Right. Um, certainly for them uh, ends up bringing, you know, bringing them with marvelous speed to a place they never would have gone uh, just in time to meet Treebeard uh, and end up rousing the ants and bringing about the destruction of Isengard. Right. I mean, that's that's, you know, Gandalf is pointing to the cause and effect there. But it's not just the explicitness of Gandalf pointing to it. It's the directness of it, right? We the, we see how the orcs capturing them brings them right to that point. And since they're there, bam, they meet Treebeard. This is much more indirect, right? Since they go to Weathertop, then they're attacked and Frodo is injured. And then there's this whole... And, and because of that, there's this. And because of that, there's this. And because of that, there's this. And this all leads to them at the fort. That's why I say that this argument is a little bit weaker than those other arguments. But as I said, I think it... I think it... I think it fits, right? Um, I think that there are other ways. Uh, uh, there are other ways in which we could see this. That is, I guess, my suggestion for this reading would not be simply to tie it to the destruction of the Ringwraiths at Bruinir. I, I think you, I, it's an argument that you can make here. I, the fact that I think it's it's weakened by the indirectness of it doesn't mean that there's no argument for it. Um, I kind of like it. But uh, but like I said, it's it, it, it it's it's not like a, a sort of a slam dunk as far as the reading is concerned, because uh, there's too much uncertainty about that. Um, but I would be interested in thinking about other ways um, in other ways that this has an impact. Right. Matt, that's a really great um, example. Right. Matt says Frodo gets his early training here uh, in resisting the one ring. Uh, the, resistance, the resistance he was not ready to focus on when he talked about becoming a wraith. Um, yes, the way in which Frodo is changed by his wounding. Right. That does seem to me to be an important part, uh, an, an important outcome of what happens here. You know, could we could we make an argument, for instance, that had Frodo not had this experience, and this is a, a complicated kind of experience, right? Had he never um, experienced this temptation from the ring and given into it, because he does, he's going to fail, right? Um, he's going to fail in what in the end is going to turn out to be a small way at Weathertop, right? It's not a, it's not a, a an ultimate and permanent failure either for him or for Middle Earth, right? Um, but he's going to fail in this small way. Is that does that failure strengthen him down the road? Does the experience of the near entry into the wraith, where you know the sort of the wraithification process that begins happening to him between Weathertop and Rivendell, how does that impact him moving forward and his relationship with the Ring and his ability to uh, to resist? the ring. Uh, JJ, absolutely. The, the impact that it has on Sam and the others, right? And the way that they um, perhaps have a different perspective now on this adventure that they're on. Um, there are many other ways 
um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the uh, 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 trifle says that uh, is, is remembering Sam's comment uh, at the Falls of Rauros uh, in their little council there uh, about how they've all had a bit of schooling. Right. Since they left home. Yeah, it, that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm that I'm, that I'm thinking of there. Um, so there are other ways, in other words, that I think that we can kind of construct this or, or we can kind of maybe think about it uh, in, in this sort of a bigger sense. Um, but again, fundamentally speaking, I think that this seems that this reading seems right. That is the, the, the basic impulse here to say what we're seeing here is providence at work. Now, here's the other clarification that I, that would offer, I would offer to that, though. Uh, and that would be a clarification I would uh, give right in the first sentence. Um, that providence, uh, the, 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 the description of the intercession of the hand of providence, um, and the idea that climbing Weathertop was something that he really had to do. Um, that's not how providence works. Um, so I would I would definitely want to sort of clarify that. Again, I'm not disagreeing with the principle. Do I think that providence is at work here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but providence is working through, uh, not it's not causing Strider's decision. It's working through Strider's decision. This is one thing that we see very persistently throughout Tolkien's works, especially through The Lord of the Rings, um, is that... I, actually, I, I'm going to actually withdraw throughout Tolkien's works, because we don't always see it earlier on. This is something that really, I think, uh, is developing. We see a good deal less of his contemplations of, you know, uh, 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 destiny and free will in the uh, in the early works. So the Book of Lost Tales, um, there's a lot more fate and a lot less emphasis, I would say, uh, on 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 free will. Uh, Belongsmond asks, uh, when is providence not at work? Oh, well, never. The only thing is, is that we can't always, we can't always see what it's doing, right? That's the primary difference. Um, there are, it's, it's not that there are some moments when providence is active and some moments when providence is taking a nap, right? The point is that there are some moments when we can see in retrospect, Right, the hand of providence uh, involved in in guiding events, um, and sometimes where we just can't, we just don't see enough of the picture to be able to see how it all fits together. Right, that's that's really the difference there. Um, so, uh, um, anyway, uh, so. Mad Violinus says, uh, do I see this as different from examples in the Old Testament where God moves someone to do something either positive or negative? Yes, I do. Well, okay, I do. Basically, yes. Uh, when God moves people to do things in the Old Testament, it's often a, a good deal more direct. That is to say, the you can you can uh, talk about the application of doctrines of of uh, you know predestination and 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 foreknowledge and free will in the Old Testament. But that doesn't strike me as actually something that the text itself is very concerned to make a distinction between. Um, uh, really, this is a deep subject that we don't need to go too much further in there. But what I will say is that I do think that, and we see this right from the music of the Ainur on forward. The music of the Ainur is where this is most explicitly brought out, really. But we can see it, um, we can see it through the um, through the. Uh, through the Lord of the Rings, uh, certainly, and as I argue through The Hobbit as well. Um, and that is the way in which people's choices are active, right? And people's choices mean something. And yet, through the choices that they make, the the work of providence is done, right? So uh, anyway, that's um, uh, that's that's definitely... Something that I think Tolkien is very interested in, something that we see uh, uh, repeatedly through the Lord of the Rings. So again, my, my only, I don't know if it's a quibble or a clarification or what I would call it a clarification, because I think it's sort of a friendly amendment to what old Tolkien fan is saying here, um, is that it's not a question of, it's not a question of providence compelling Strider 
to do something, right? Strider makes up his own mind, right? And yet that choice by Strider is, even though it's not necessarily, uh, uh, not necessarily a, a good choice, right? Um, uh, it's not necessarily a right choice, not necessarily the wisest choice. And yet that choice, um, as is so often the case when the bad choices of people end up getting used for the ultimate good, right? Again, this is a pattern. This is a thing. This is why I ultimately, at the end of the day, I really like this reading, right? Uh, because it seems to me to fit um, with the way that things work uh, in this in in the world. So I think it's very relevant to bring it up and interesting to think about what good does come out of Weathertop, right? Um, evil comes of Weathertop. I mean, evil to Frodo, uh, suffering comes, and and it's not to 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 you know both both short term and long term suffering comes to Frodo from this. I mean, it's his wound at Weathertop that is you know was one of the wounds that's never fully healed, right? And he he uh, is pained by it years later. So, um, uh, lots of things. Uh, 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 which are which 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 remain evil, right? Uh, uh, come from it, but again, that doesn't change the fact, right? And again, it's one of those central things, one of the ways in which Tolkien really engages, and I think engages much more interestingly than many other authors who have attempted to engage with this theme. He doesn't he doesn't pull the punches about this. Right. Um, these are these are wrong choices and bad things, really bad things that really are bad come from it. Right. Not just apparently bad, not just bad because we're ignorant or have a limited perspective, really bad. And yet through those bad things, good comes. Right. Which doesn't cancel it out, which doesn't make the evil as if it never were. But good, in fact, has come and evil and the good couldn't have been. Had the evil not occurred, the evil is made in by providence, made instrumental to the bringing about of the good. Right? Um, it's not just that the like more good comes later to balance it out or something. I guess not how it works in Tolkien. Right? Um, anyway, so I, I I I do think that that's certainly I think an important theme uh, in the Lord of the Rings, uh, and so I'm very willing to see that active here, and interested to um. Uh, to to sort of enter that into the sort of log, right, in thinking about Aragorn's decisions, uh, because I rather suspect that if we looked, we would see that almost any time Aragorn makes a wrong decision, it's going to probably end up uh, being used for good. So we'll see. But Tony, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's all in Boethius. What do they teach them in these schools? Uh, exactly right. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going then. So we just did the poem, right? We talked about the poem last time. That was so much fun, by the way. I learned so much about that poem last week. Uh, and, um, uh, the, 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 the ways and special, what had never really come home to me, uh, quite as much before our discussion last week was how much of a teaching poem uh, that really is. That it was in Hobbit Meter was something that I noticed a long time ago. Um, that it's uh, something that Sam learned at school, right? Because it's a school poem uh, is um, is is definitely, I think, uh, was was uh, was was new to me and really fun. Um, yeah, cool. Um, okay. Anyway, so let's look at the uh, reaction. We still haven't even heard who was speaking yet. The others turned in amazement, for the voice was Sam's. Don't stop, said Mary. That's all I know, stammered Sam, blushing. I learned it from Mr. Bilbo when I was a lad. He used to tell me tales like that, knowing how I was always one for hearing about elves. It was Mr. Bilbo has taught me my letters. He was mighty book-learned, was dear old Mr. Bilbo, and he wrote poetry. He wrote what I have just said. He did not make it up, said Strider. It's part of the lay that is called the Fall of Gilgalad. Sorry, I should say the fall of Gilgalad, which is in an ancient tongue. Bilbo must have translated it. I never knew that. There was a lot more, said Sam, all about Mordor. I didn't learn that part. It gave me the shivers. I never thought I should be going that way myself. Going to Mordor, cried Pippin. I hope it won't come to that. Don't speak that name so loudly, said Strider. Okay, 
Lots to talk about here, including some of the discussions that were happening on the discussion board this week. Um, th- JJ, that's exactly what the discussion was. So let's just go ahead and start there, um, which is why doesn't Frodo comment on Strider's comment? I never knew that. Right. Um, which would seem to imply that he knows Bilbo. Right. couple things here. Um the the difficulty and I apologize I'm forgetting I'm blanking on the name of the person who was bringing this up who raised this uh, on the discussion board my apologies for that um, if anybody can look at it and remind me I'd appreciate that uh, but anyway um, he the, the 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 problem that he's having is okay so he here Strider in front of Frodo you know to Frodo is saying that is acknowledging that he knows Bilbo right. Um, Frodo doesn't comment on it at all, and he seems surprised when he gets to Rivendell and uh, finds that Bilbo's old friend that he's talking to turns out to be Strider, even though the emphasis is on the fact that he has a lot of names, right? Uh, yet there still seems to be some surprise that uh, that that Strider and Bilbo know each other. Why wouldn't Frodo have guessed that since Strider reveals that he's friends with Bilbo and why doesn't Frodo even talk about it? Right. And why, how is it that Frodo is still surprised to meet Bilbo when he sees him in the hall of fire for the first time? Because if, if Strider has acknowledged that he knows Bilbo, surely it's come up. Surely Frodo's asked him. Um, so uh, anyway, that's that. Th- those are the, the, that's the kind of series of questions that this, uh, that this, that this raises. Um, and uh <laughs> Blad the Inspirer. There it is. Thanks, Lincoln. Um, okay, so uh, I think there are a couple things. Um, one, uh, first thing, I'm not sure that that necessarily comes out like we might be hearing it there, right? Um, I... I I totally get it. I totally understand. And I've always kind of heard it that way in my own head too. the kind of affection in the sentence. I never knew that. Right. I never knew that. Bilbo did that. Oh, wow. That's, that's cool. I never knew that, which does suggest that he knows lots of other things that Bilbo has done and didn't realize that that was among them. Right. Um, but I don't think that that's the only way to read that. Um, if we think about this, especially from the point of view of the hobbits who, have been traveling with Strider for a few days now, but, but still, you know, I, they, they, um, they've accept the fact now that he's friends with Gandalf, but they don't know much else about his history. Um, uh, anyway, uh, look at the whole shape there of what Strider says. He did not make it up. It is part of the lay that is called the fall of Gilgalad, which is in an ancient tongue. Bilbo must have translated it. I never knew that. Right. So um, Bilbo must have translated. So he's not talking about Bilbo exactly. He's talking. um, He's talking about uh, the poem. Right. Uh, So, you know, you don't necessarily have to read that last sentence as and I am affectionately familiar with most of the literary works of Bilbo Baggins. And I did not realize that that was among them. Rather, you could read it as. I thought I was pretty familiar with all of the different renditions of the, of this poem. I didn't realize that there was one kicking around the Shire, right? Um, so, it, you know, the familiarity that underlies that sentence needn't be... I mean, we know that it is, right, in retrospect, right? But at the time, and to Frodo, it needn't necessarily come across like a familiarity with Bilbo, but rather as a familiarity with the different versions of the of the, the sto- of the fall of Gilgalad that are kicking around, right? Um, so, uh, anyway, yeah, the... the uh, I see uh, Pookie Mojo. Um, how... The answer to how I pronounce Gilgalad is with unashamed inconsistency, <laughs> right? Whenever I'm talking about this poem, I say Gilgalad because it's very clear from the meter. You have to read it Gilgalad. You just can't not read it that way when you're reading this poem. But every other time it comes up, I'm going to call him Gilgalad because that's what I do. I'm sorry. I've done it since I was a kid and I'm not going to change. Um, too old to change now. 
<laughs> can, you tell, can you tell us my birthday before long? <laughs> I'm very focused on becoming an old man lately. Uh, anyway, I'm just going to, I'm owning it, right? I'm owning it. It's, it's it. Like I'm, I'm an old man with a gray beard now and that's, that's who I am. And that's okay. I can live with that. Any, because it gives me the right to be inconsistent in how I pronounce Gilgoad when I want to. By golly, and there you go. Um, <laughs> it's just right I'm always says you're older than me. That's good, so that you get the right to do that too. It's awesome, right? We can share. It's perfect. Um, anyhow, okay, so. I. Uh, so that's one thing, right? So, so, so one thing there is like I, this doesn't have to be said in a tone of affection. I don't think. I think that if we if we kind of translate that um, that sentence, you know, I never knew that as like the, that that by definition means an expression of affection, fond affection towards Bilbo. It does. I mean, that is one possibility of it, and we do know that, of course, in fact, that that's one of the things that's behind it. But it doesn't have to sound that way. Um, uh, so that's. Um, that's one thing. The second thing, <laughs> Karita says, what is get off my lawn in Cinderin? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Um, oh, Belongsmond, yeah. Uh, Belongsmond is saying, I just need eyebrows that go out past the brim of my hat. Belongsmond, I've been working on that for years. I really have. Uh, and every time my wife tells me I need to trim my eyebrows, I'm like, no, they don't stick out past the brim of my hat yet. I'm working on that. Anyway, yeah. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, anyway, so, um, Bilbo, um, so, so again, first of all, I, I, I don't think that we have to read this as a giveaway, right? As a giveaway for, um, his relationship with Bilbo. It's, it's not that clear a tell. And then you factor in the other elements, uh, that are here that other people were, were pointing to, right? Um, and that is, this is there's a lot of there's a lot else going on right now, right? And you think about this, um, the way that the, the the way that it flits by, right? He says that, and then Sam starts talking about Mordor, and then Pippin is like going to Mordor, and then Strider's like shut up. So I mean, there's lots of things happening there, um, and they're you know this is a kind of a tense moment, and then you know, and then later on they're going to be really scared, and then Frodo's going to get injured. So there's all kinds of reasons, perhaps, why uh, uh, you know even if there might be the chance uh, that they can uh, that they can uh, see that, right? That, that that they could, you know, possibly piece it together that he knows Bilbo, that it would just kind of go over their head here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. JJ says, it's not that it necessarily means affection to me as much as it is if Strider doesn't know Bilbo, why is it noteworthy that he doesn't know something about him? Um uh, and she thinks that the uh, talking about the poem explanation doesn't sound right. Um, maybe the distracted theory fits a bit better. Well, I would get, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the, you know, that he, you know, is interested in lore about the, you know, about sort of the, the state and circulation of this old lore seems to me potentially to work. Um, the other thing that I would say, because this is another thing that was brought up by Blod in his original post, um, is why does Strider never tell Frodo that Bilbo is safe at Rivendell and that he's going to see him when he gets there? Uh, and the... I mean, I think the answer to that, and this I think was suggested by at least one person in response to that, um, uh, in, in, in response to that uh, uh, original post, Bilbo's made it pretty clear that he doesn't like want his whereabouts known, right? Um, so uh, Frodo, uh, Strider, that Strider is not going to blab about that doesn't, I mean, it might seem to us sort of cold, like, man, like he's missing Bilbo and you're not even going to just drop him a, 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 you know, just, I mean, just mention it. Right. I mean, just throw him a bone here. Right. Um, no, no, um, I don't, uh, I, 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 it does not surprise me that Strider wouldn't do that. Right. That he wouldn't talk about that. Um, Blizzard says because he didn't ask him. Well, in part, yeah. Um, 
uh, interesting. JJ says also Bilbo's aging again. Maybe he doesn't want to get Frodo's hopes up just to find out that Bilbo passed away since Strider was last there. And of course, another thing, uh, Bruinier says, could Bilbo have been in Dale when Strider last left? left Rivendell Bruner. That's just what I was going to say. Uh, it's not, it's, uh, it might've been some time uh, since Aragorn was in Rivendell, right? So just because even if Bilbo were there the last time that he was in Rivendell, that doesn't prove that he's still there, right? So Strider doesn't, Strider still does not know, you may say, exactly where Bilbo is. All that he knows is that he, uh, uh, that he, was there at some point. Right. And so for him to, for him to kind of uh, be discreet about stuff, which was, which he knows to be something which was actively designed to be a secret from folks in the Shire would not surprise me all by itself. Right. Um, That he's not going to say to Frodo, Oh, you'll probably, I'm sure Bilbo's probably still there. Every reason to think Bilbo's still there in Rivendell. What evidence does he have? JJ, as you say, maybe he died of old age, right? Who knows? Maybe he went away. Maybe he's in Dale, right? So why should he say to Frodo that he'll probably see him there when he doesn't actually know that? Um, uh, yeah, Harnuth points out that Bilbo didn't see fit to tell Frodo where he was. I'm sure that one fact was sufficient for Strider to respect Bilbo's privacy. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Bilbo could have written, right? Been like, have retired to Rivendell, right? Been given lovely set of uh, rooms and, um, you know, enjoying myself immensely. Uh, you know, uh, hugs and kisses, Uncle Bilbo, right? He could have he could have sent that letter and he never did, right? Strider may know that he never did. So that all that all makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, the quick post doesn't run from the Misty Mountains forth, Dauntless, but he totally could have gotten a letter there, right? At some point in the last 17 years, that totally could have happened. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Mad Violin Assessor, maybe he did, and and and, and uh, Butterbur didn't send it on. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Lincoln was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool, cool. Um, if, yeah, that would be a very advanced mail quest, Amathorn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, cool. All right, so uh, so good. And then, of course, once they get once they get into Rivendell, nobody tells them because just because they don't want to ruin the surprise, right? Um. Anyway, okay. Uh, let's. Uh, wait, no, let's not keep going. We still have, I have more things. So, um. I don't want to miss the significance of the, I guess there's another thing that was talked about a little bit on the discussion boards, uh, boards, the, and he wrote poetry, right? I love the reverence of that line. He was mighty book learned was dear old Mr. Bilbo, right? The combination of respect tinged with awe and affection in that sentence is is superlatively balanced, right? It's a perfect snapshot into Sam Gamgee's attitude towards Bilbo. Um, He is, on the one hand, he's dear old Mr. Bilbo, but he is also like a scholar who writes poetry, right? Which is like practically a different species, right? I mean, that's just unattainable, right? Um, And yeah, exactly. Uh, Both Tony and JJ are recalling the prosy uh, uh, remark uh, in chapter one of The Hobbit, which is 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 really wonderful in retrospect, isn't it? How Bilbo is is becomes famous for poetry and only likes writing poetry, right? So he uh, has uh, uh, begins rather to lose touch with his prosy background uh, in in his uh, in his later days. Um, uh, uh, interesting. Fourth Thoughtless says hyphenated word alert. Yeah, book learned. Yes, book learned is a, an important conjunction. There are different kinds of learning, right? And uh, the um, uh, the you know, book learning is the 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 kind of learning that he's talking about here. Other people have learning too. Uh, it's not like the Gamgees are ignorant; they just don't have book learning, right? Um, and I saw that uh, 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 somebody was quoting the Gaffer's line, you know, meaning no harm, right? Earlier on. You'll notice there's no such qualification here. Um, In fact, in retrospect, the way in which Sam talks about not only his own instruction by Bilbo, but Bilbo's book learning itself, 
there is no question in Sam's mind that there is no harm to the book learning, right? Uh, Sam has no anticipation of harm coming to himself or to Bilbo himself as a product of book learning, right? Um, so in retrospect, that comment from the gaffer, he's learned him his letters, meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it, right? Um, seems almost like a... Uh, why has Gaffer Gamgee had his son Sam educated by Bilbo? Answer, because he couldn't stop him, probably, right? Um, this is, I think, clearly initiated by Sam. I cannot imagine that Gaffer Gamgee approached Bilbo and said, could you please educate my son, right? I am sure that that is not how that happened, right? It is clearly, uh, you know, Sam, uh, Bilbo knowing that Sam was always one for hearing about elves, right? It's Sam's own love for the stories that Bilbo told, which led Bilbo to learn him his letters, right? Which led Bilbo to educate Sam. So the desire to be educated must have initiated with Sam, not with Hamfast, right? And so, but Hamfast agreed, right? So his father, uh, Sam's father gave him permission to learn his letters from Mr. Bilbo. Right. Which, of course, is a significant that would have taken some time. Right. You know, so the, 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 the time that he spent with Bilbo, which could easily have looked like time wasting. Right. To to the gaffer, there's serious work to be done. Right. There's gardening to be done. There's there's lawns to be mowed. You know, they're 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 a working class family. Right. Um, but he lets his Sam invest his time in this questionable pursuit of book learning. And now at the pub, he's defending that in a, in essence, right? Uh, and so you can hear what I hear in that comment, meaning no harm, Mark, you and I, and I hope no harm will come of it, um, as kind of temporizing between, on the one hand, he's been convinced by his son to say yes, right? And give his blessing to the whole learning of letters by his son. Um, and yet he's still kind of dubious about it and is openly expressing dubiousness, Um because I don't think that Gaffer Gamgee would want to come to. I think that people would look at him funny if he were just simply open and positive about Sam's book learning. Right. Oh, yeah. Did you guys hear Mr. Bilbo's teaching my son Sam book learning? I think that his peers, uh, the Gaffer's peers, would probably look at him funny if he said that. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fourth thought says, wouldn't the gaffer have been uncomfortable asking Bilbo not to teach Sam? I don't think so. I think that he, I, I, think, I think the discomfort would have worked the other way around. I think that if he were just openly thrilled about Sam ha getting book learning, that that would have been uncomfortable. Um, anyway, that's just sort of my, my, uh, my impression there. Um, Carita says that she bets anything that Bilbo offered. Um, she can't ima imagine that Sam asked. I, absolutely. I agree. I think that Sam asked again and again to hear the stories about the elves. Right. And it was Bilbo who offered to teach him his letters so that he could give him books to read. Yeah. I, I, I also totally think that that's exactly how it how it how it went down there. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and Cecilia, I agree. It would have been hard for the gaffer to to say no. I mean, if if uh, Sam comes home and says, you know, Dad, Mister Bilbo wants to teach me my letters. Is that okay? For the gaffer to be like, no, not in my house. You tell that, Mister Bilbo. Mister Bilbo is his employer, right? Um, uh, you know, he is the uh, he is he is servant to Mister Bilbo, so. You know, he but he could have expressed some discomfort and he could have denied it would have been certainly within his parental rights, which Bilbo, I think, would have had to respect if he had said to Sam, you know, I don't want you lollygagging around, you know, just reading books when you should be out working. Right. Um, I think he could have shown some resistance at the end of the day. Could he have like single handedly resisted the will of Bilbo? That would have been unlikely, I think, in that way. But he could have made his discomfort uh, to, to known to Bilbo if he were, if, if his sort of ruling passion about that, um, was, uh, uh, was discomfort. I think he could have expressed that Marianne, he does view Bilbo as one of his betters, but see, that would have been the premise. Had he done this, had he expressed discomfort to Bilbo, that would have been, I would think the grounds of it, 
right? Um, that he won't have his son Sam getting above himself, right? Um, you know, it's um, uh, that's something I can imagine. But again, it's it's you know he can't he can't exactly you know just get out in front of that train. I think, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in Valori, I do think that Bilbo would have shown respect to the paternal authority of the gaffer. I do think that he would have talked to the gaffer about it and he would not have been comfortable doing it had the, had he known the gaffer to be really opposed. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt says there's a certain cachet to Sam being a favorite of Bilbo, whether he was entirely comfortable with the thoughts of Sam learning to read or not. Uh, there was a hint of pride in the gaffer's concern earlier in the book. Yeah, it, no, I, 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 I hear that too, right? I, I think that his, you know, and I hope no harm comes of it, is less a him expressing his own deep felt concern and more of a kind of a concession to public opinion to, because it could look like he's being uppity, right? Like he's getting above himself. Like the, uh, you know, that, that his neighbors could think that he's putting on airs, right? If he's like, well, did you realize that my son is under the private tutelage of Mr. Bilbo? Yes, the Gamgees are rising in the world, right? That, even if he didn't have that attitude, that's how other people could have taken it, right? Um, and so I think him being like, I mean, I, I hope no harm comes of it is I think a way of him sort of showing his, this is him saying like, look, you know, we're not getting above ourselves here. Right. I'm not trying to say that my family are your betters now. Right. That's not what's happening here. Um, but yeah, Matt beneath that, I do think that there is some, uh, that there is some pride. There's no good reason for him to have brought it up. In fact, right. When you think back to it, um, uh, why should he even mention that Bilbo has, uh, has has learned Sam his letters, right? It, he kind of, I mean, he he brings it up in the context of how Sam is in and out of Bag End all the time, right? Which already sounds a little bit boastful, but in the context of his work as a gardener, you know, it's it's, it's fine, right? Um, but he talks about how he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales, right? Crazy about tales of the old days he is. And then he just mentions further right? That Mr. Bilbo has learned him his letters. Um, so I, I, Matt, when I ask myself, why does the gaffer even go there? Right. He doesn't have to say that it doesn't necessarily support his, the point, the argument that he's trying to make, um, about this is all about stuff about the party. Of course, remember, um, back in chapter one, but, uh, but he does go there. And I, 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 so I, I think that there is some reason to think that uh, although he doesn't like talking about it and was, doesn't want to seem to be putting on airs, he is proud uh, of his son and of um, um, of uh, uh, Bilbo's teaching. Yeah, it's kind of a humble brag a little bit, Mike. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good Finn was just thinking exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, good. All right. Um, let's see, what else? There's just so, so much in this passage I wanted to talk about. Uh, Sam. There was a lot more, all about Mordor. I didn't learn that part. It gave me the shivers. I never thought I should be going that way myself. So there are three things I want to talk about here. First, um, Sam's where Sam stops memorizing the poem, right? This is clearly not just all he happens to remember because he doesn't remember the poem very well, right? He memorized this part of the poem because he liked this part of the poem, right? And he didn't rem memorize the rest of it uh, because he didn't like it. He didn't choose. He didn't try to learn the rest of the poem. Why? Because it's all about Mordor and gave him the shivers. 
Now, if we think about this, right, the poem is called, as Strider tells us, The Fall of Gilgalad. So, okay, he's, it's the story of Gilgalad's march on, you know, in the, 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 the Last Alliance, uh, and presumably is going to feature a, a very heavily, right, the, the duel with Sauron on, uh, on Mount Doom. That's, ironically, something which is, um, uh, this is this is something that is going to be very relevant to Sam. Um, I never thought I should be going that way myself is, of course, exactly true. Not only is he going to Mordor, he is, in fact, going to go to the slopes of the very same mountain on which Gogolad fell. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> so it's interesting uh, that it's interesting in retrospect uh, to see that the story, which is in a sense a really powerful role model for him, right? The story of an ancient hero who boldly went to Mordor to resist the enemy and fought and died uh, resisting the enemy on the very slopes of Mount Doom itself, uh, but brought, but by doing so helped to bring about, you know, the downfall of the enemy. That's a pretty direct parallel, right? That, that, you know, but instead of Sam being like, there was something about that story that just always moved me, right? I always felt like, you know, for some reason, like that, 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 uh, that story just really got me. No, it's not that at all, right? Sam wanted nothing to do with that story. It gave him the shivers, right? Um, the idea of Mordor gives him the shivers, it seems. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the first thing, right? To think that uh, we don't see Sam with some kind of sense of his destiny here, right? Um, we just know that, and, and but we and we also know uh, from Sam's later discussions that he's not going to dislike the poem just because it's sad, right? Um, the fact that the, the, the fact that this is going to ultimately talk about the death of Gilgalad is not why he doesn't like it, right? It's Mordor and the descriptions of Mordor and the idea of going to Mordor. This is what gives him the shivers, right? Uh, there was a lot more all about Mordor. Notice he doesn't say all about Gilgalad going to Mordor or anything or all about Gilgalad's struggle against the enemy in Mordor. No, to Sam, the rest of this poem was about Mordor and he doesn't like it, right? Um, Mordor is what gave him the shivers. Um, so, um, so that's interesting, right? Uh, that, that, uh, that that's kind of what he took from it. Um, that that's what really affected him, uh, strongly in that way. Um, JJ, uh, and, um, uh, Tony are both thinking about the rest of the poem. Um, do we know what the rest of the poem is? On the one hand... A big when we're told that a poem in the Lord of the Rings is only a part of a longer poem. Sometimes there is more, <laughs> right? Uh, we know that Tolkien spent a lot of his time, especially back uh, in the in the twenties, say, um, writing poetry. Right? That's when he wrote the the alliterative uh, lay of the Children of Hurin. That's when he wrote uh, the lay of Lathian. Which was which was re-released in in Baron and Luthien, uh, the Baron and Luthien book recently. Um, uh, anyway, there's 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 um, uh, lots of stuff. There's lots of poems, many other poems and fragments of poems uh, that Tolkien began. Poem about the kinslaying, you know, a, a bunch of other things um, that he never finished, right? And yet he'll still either draw on them or allude to them, um, and um, uh, and that'll, um, you know, and so, so there'll be a reference to, to a poem and the poem actually sort of exists. Um, but I don't think this is one. I don't recall. Uh, I don't remember, maybe I'm misremembering, but I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, that there exists more of that poem. Um, which I agree is too bad. I would really like to hear more. Um, Though one of the challenging things, would it, would we want more in this meter, right? The particular nature of this meter 
and the the sort of maybe maybe it would modulate maybe it modulates maybe it loses the extreme regularity and the kind of sing song nature of the uh of the the verses that we get from Sam here um as it gets to the you know dramatic bits right um i mean bilbo's a good enough poet to manage that presumably um it would be a little bit hard if if it kind of bobbed along like this the whole way right in these super regular ims but um anyway uh but yeah it doesn't exist as far as i know okay second thing second to last thing i knew this is this slide was going to take a while second to last thing um sam versus pippin on their destination right um it is not at all surprising that we see a discrepancy between Sam and Pippin in how they have conceived of this journey that they're on, right? And this is something that we've seen and have, have been looking at, especially since Conspiracy Unmasked, right? Um, so um, one of the things that we were looking at there was the fact that um, he... Uh, he um, Pippin in particular, right, as they're singing the song about going to Rivendell, you know, this is just poetry to him, right? They seem, they, the conspirators, seem clearly to believe that Rivendell, this is the destination, this is the goal of their journey, right? Um, and, uh, they, but, yeah, so, I mean, going to Mordor is way off Pippin's radar screen, right? Um, why on earth would they go to Mordor? Right. Um, whereas for Sam, Sam has been kind of thinking, I mean, it's obvious that he's thinking that way already. Right. I never should. I, 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 I never thought I should be going that way myself. Right. Um, it's, he om seems almost to take it for granted that in the end, Mordor is where he's going to go. Um, and that's interesting. Right. Now, it's not like that comes out of nowhere. Frodo has been told, how can you? dispose of the ring right you can you know gandalf says if you really want to see it destroyed you've got to take it to the cracks of doom where it was forged right he's told that at the beginning and here uh so before we even get to the difference between pippin and sam which again i think there's not even that much to talk about there because that's pretty clear why there's a difference there the interesting thing to me, is the difference between Frodo and, and Sam here, right? Frodo does not necessarily assume that Mordor is his destination, right? Um, he's going to get there, but Sam is there way before him. Why is Sam there way before him? And to me, I think that it um, it makes a lot of sense, actually, uh, if you think about it. How does Frodo talk about his journey? Why doesn't he want to take anyone with him? Right. He doesn't want to take anyone with him because he's going fleeing from danger into danger and drawing it after him. Right. He sees himself as going there and not back again. He's going into exile, as he says. Right. Frodo doesn't know whether or not he's going to Mordor. Gandalf says that quest may be for others. Right. So neither Gandalf nor Frodo necessarily assumes that Mordor is the ultimate destination of their trip. Right. He just wants to get out of the Shire. Because he is the keeper of the ring for now. He's agreed to keep it hidden. He knows the enemy is hunting for it. The enemy is, if he stays here, the enemy has his address, right? So the enemy is going to get there eventually. So he needs to go somewhere where the enemy won't find it, right? So all he's doing is eluding the enemy, Frodo, right? That's his quest at this point. Not the destruction of the ring, but the getting away from the servants of the enemy. That is the, the goal of his quest. And this is why he said it's, it's open-ended. Right. Uh, uh, you know, he, he doesn't see that that he, he's not on a trip that has a destination. Mordor going to Mordor, uh, as Sam is suggesting, I never thought I should be going that way myself. Mordor is still a there and back again journey. It's a longer there and back again journey. It's maybe a darker and even more dangerous there and back again journey than Bilbo's. But that's still a there and back again journey. Again, remember, that's exactly what Frodo said he, he did not see, right? He did not think of. Uh, he did not think about his, his own journey that way. Um, so he sees himself just going, fleeing from danger into danger and drawing it after him. But what does Sam see? Sam says, obviously, we're heading to Mordor. Why would that be obvious to Sam? 
right? And I think the reason that that is obvious to Sam is what Sam's priority, right? Sam's priority is not protecting the ring. Sam's priority is not even saving the world. Sam's priority is protecting Frodo, right? And doing what he has to do to defend Frodo. What does he have to do? And so this is a no brainer, right? Frodo has the ring in order to free Frodo from the ring and this danger that he's in. They're going to have to go to Mordor, right? They got, that's the only way to get rid of the ring. Right. And so therefore, um, that's what's going to have to end up happening, right? Frodo may think that he's going to do something else or Frodo may, you know, but Sam's got a, a, a more of a plan, right? Um, he, he needs to look out for Mr. Frodo and that means getting rid of this ring. And if that means going to Mordor, that means going to Mordor. That's the only way to do it, right? If Mr. Gandalf says that's the only way to do it, then that's the way to do it. So I guess, you know, my, you know, Mordor is on the itinerary somewhere, right? Whereas Frodo doesn't seem to take that for granted. So that I think is, is a really interesting thing. Whereas Pippin, again, still just kind of oblivious. He doesn't, he know, he knows the basic facts. Frodo has the ring, what the ring is, what that means, the enemy searching for him. Um, but Hobbit walking party, right? We've seen this before. Um, they, they know how dangerous it is now to some extent. Um, but he still thinks their job is just to get it to Rivendell. It is quite possible, Tony, that Frodo's trying not to think that far ahead. Um, that seems that seems very likely. Um, do I think that this necessarily means that Frodo is more pessimistic than Sam? Not necessarily. Um, again, notice Sam doesn't speak confidently about coming home afterwards, right? He just says he never thought that I should be going that way myself. In fact, if anything, he's suggesting the opposite. If he, by saying this, is is paralleling himself to Gilgalad, right? Here's a, I love this poem about Gilgalad, but I didn't like the bit about him going to Mordor and dying a horrible death there. That was not my favorite part of the poem. Never thought I should be going that way myself, meaning going that way towards Mordor, also potentially going that way in the sense of dying a noble and self-sacrificial death on the slopes of Mount Doom, right? Uh, there are lots of ways I thought I might go, but I never really thought that that would be it, right? And yet, you know, he's he's embraced at least that possibility here. Right. Um, so uh, anyway, yeah, that's um, that's that's, I think, uh, important to see. Bruinier asks a great question. When does Pippin get out of the Hobbit walking party mode? Great question. Um, we've had some reason to think that he's already out of it or at least thinking a little bit differently uh, since there's already been a bunch of things that have happened to them, right? Um, and yet this is an interesting piece of evidence to show that he still is in it, right? He still is thinking of it. I, he seems to now understand better the magnitude of their danger, right? But that doesn't mean... Um, and by the way, this is, again, one of the reasons why I found... I dislike that scene in the movie about them, uh, you know, cooking bacon on the side of Weathertop uh, in giving away their position, right? They're not, Pippin, even Pippin's not an idiot, right? He's not a fool. He knows the Black Riders are really dangerous. He knows they're being hunted. Um, he's, he's, he's not, uh, just silly like that. Um, what he doesn't understand is the role that they have to play, right? Again, he thinks, he knows they're on a dangerous journey now, but he still thinks it's a dangerous journey to Rivendell. Um, so when he says going to Mordor, I hope it won't come to that. I think that we can already hear a difference between Pippin saying that and Pippin saying, oh, that was poetry back in chapter four. Right. Um, no, no, no. We're not really going to do those things in the poem here. He's saying um, uh, here. He's saying uh, going to Mordor. I hope it won't come to that. But it, that's not to say I thought we were just having fun, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I, I, I was thinking, I know we're on a dangerous journey, but I thought it was a dangerous journey to Rivendell, right? And then we were done at that point, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Let's see. Um, yeah, uh, Tony says he, he would argue that he doesn't fully come out of it until Minas Tirith, uh, when Gandalf tells him to open his eyes and ears. 
yet some of Gandalf's rebukes there, some of the things that we see, uh, the realizations Pippin is making. Uh, Tony, I think you make a pretty strong, you can make a pretty strong argument. Um, uh, when he asked the question, uh, um, uh, Bruinier uh, was saying, uh, you know, maybe the capture by the Urukai, but Tony, I do think you can make the argument to say that he's still kind of in Hobbit walking party mode uh, in Minas Tirith, and it's only his experience with Denethor and Faramir uh, that really kind of shakes him out of that. Um, Matt says that Sam has thought this through, uh, uh, and it's uh, and that he hasn't seen evidence that Frodo, Merry, and Pippin have really uh, thought it through to the point of its being a there and back again story. Um, yeah, yeah, and no, I, I agree. I think that he has thought it through a little bit differently. It's not just like when we think back to the conversation he had with the elves, it's not even just what the elves told him, right? It's also what he, like the way that he's talking to the elves, right? He, 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 or even just the fact that he's talking to the elves about it, right, shows that he's thinking it through in a, in, in a different kind of way. Um, yeah, uh, ooh. Uh, new person, Ferith of Ecstasia, uh, says, uh, possibly because Sam is, as we talked about before, more of a pessimist. The rest of them are trying not to think about it or are trying to convince themselves that they can find some other solution. But Sam skips to the most obvious and likely hopeless answer. Um, yes, there is this sort of a confronting of that. And I wanted to add what Ambrosius Aurelianus was saying. Uh, he says, in my experience, people with a servant mindset, especially if they're helping someone undergoing great difficulty, sometimes assume that the worst might come and commit in their mind to seeing it through. Um, this helps them react quicker when a new problem arises because they've already committed to being a humble servant long term rather than looking for the first chance to bail out. I think that Sam has really internalized this. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, and I, that's what I think Yeah, exactly that we can see why he's already reconciled to the fact that going to Mordor is probably going to be his job, right? Because in part, because that's the worst case scenario, but I am uncomfortable with applying the word pessimist to Sam. I want to avoid that term, actually, if we can. Um, I, in fact, I'm going to suggest, uh, at least as a kind of experiment, let's try none of us to use the word optimist or pessimist uh, involving any of the characters. Here's the reason I say that. First of all, those aren't words from this text. That's not vocabulary that this text uses. It's much, always much more beneficial uh, to use the vocabulary of the text itself, right? In the terms of this story, how would we describe them? Optimist and pessimist are external to this story, right? And what's more, optimist and pessimist are fudgy words, right? They have a, they have a strict meaning uh, from a philosophical standpoint. They have a much looser sort of colloquial meaning, um, uh, and that sometimes people mean it one way and sometimes another way. So they're kind of sloppy in that way as well. Um, so let's, uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to not use those words. Um, yeah, see mad violence. Exactly. If we, if we, if we, um, if we stop talking about optimism and pessimism and start talking about hope and despair instead, see, now we're onto something. Now we're dealing with something that the text is really giving us, right? Um, rather than trying to um, fit things that are in the text into external categories, especially sloppy if those external categories themselves are terms that we're possibly not all using the same definitions of, right? So that's, that's, those are the two reasons why I want to avoid that. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Matt, that's a really interesting point. Um, uh, Matt says, I think we also need to take on board that Pippin has a certain kind of humility, the kind that a knight is supposed to have, um, that may be coloring some of his comments. He's going to deny being the Prince of the Halflings when he gets to Minas Tirith, despite the fact that he kind of is the Prince of the Halflings, right? Um yeah, yeah. No, I think there's, uh, uh, you can see a kind, a, a species of humility, right, in Pippin's, I hope it won't come to that, right? The very idea that he's thinking their job is to get the ring to, to Rivendell, right? You could argue, and a couple of you were suggesting something kind of similar to this, um, uh, uh, that Sam's 
concept that he's going to be going that way himself is sort of him imagining himself being in one of old Mr. Bilbo's stories. Quite literally, right? One of old Mr. Bilbo's stories was about Gilgalad going to, to Mordor, and he's imagining himself in it, right? Going to Mordor, going that way himself, right? Um, so you could say that there's actually a kind of grandiosity to that. Um, whereas Pippin is like, what? What are you talking about, right? Our job, getting to Rivendell is enough for us, isn't it, right? Oh, won't our job be done at that point? Um, so yeah, I, I think that you can you can definitely, uh, Matt, think about um, that that way. Um Let's see. The oh yes. Uh, I I see other people bringing up other terms: pragmatist, realist. Ooh, realism. Oh, that's one of my least favorite words. Um, I could talk about talk about dodgy words that people use in so many different ways, and which has a technical definition that means one thing. And oh my goodness. Uh, oh, the wealth of. Uh, uh, the wealth of uh, uh, of sort of worldview assumptions that underlie the use of the word realistic um, so often. And again, none of these terms are terms uh, that the text uses. Let's focus on finding the vocabulary that the text uses to talk about the things that we're talking about, um, rather than trying to apply these categories, which again, as I say, are kind of problematic in their own ways. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and and bringing uh, bring bringing them in, um, yeah. Uh, oh, Lincoln, yeah, uh, 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 realistic and realist and realistic <laughs> gives me the heebie-jeebies every time people use that. I'd, I've had so many bad experiences with that in literary discussions and elsewhere. Right? It's just uh, so many things. So many things. Anyway, um, uh, so let's. Um, um, yeah, exactly, Ferreth. Who is a realist depends entirely on what is real. And now, all of a sudden, we are in, like, a world of metaphysics that we just don't need to do, right? Again, because kind of, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, again, we need to base it uh, on the text. So, um, yeah. Good, Matt. That is another important way to think about this. Matt is saying uh, Sam is looking uh, at his... Uh, job. You know, he, he's looking at this as a job he has to do uh, in a way that his three companions... Uh, don't they, they don't have jobs to do they don't think about it in this same way i would say matt i mean i, I think you could argue that pippin is imagining that they have a not a job he's not thinking about it in the same way and i do think that that isn't an, introduces an important distinction right um sam's got a job that he has to do pippin has a quest that he's on and that's those are not the same things right but uh pippin does think they have a, a role to play get the ring to, to Rivendell, right? And then they can retire. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Gilgon Theory, I, I agree that, you know, uh, uh, you know, people want to talk about the difference between like a, a job or a duty or a responsibility, as Amethorn suggests. Sure, but job actually is a term that Sam is going to use. <laughs> about the, he hasn't used it yet is an example of a of vocabulary from the text right uh sam does in fact talk that way um so uh yeah yeah um yeah anyway okay um Yes, Druid's Fire, part of a servant's skill set is having to anticipate their master's needs. And Druid's Fire, that's kind of where I started with this particular discussion, right? That he knows what his master needs is to get to Mordor and, and offload this ring, right? Um, I, 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 Sam doesn't have his target, his his focus set on saving the world. His focus is set on, on saving and serving Mr. Frodo, right? And what it's going to take is uh, going to Mordor. So he's ready right he's already gotten used to the idea that mortar is their ultimate ultimate destination one last thought on pippin's comment i hope it won't come to that um since pippin and mary both seem to have fairly firmly in their minds that going to rivendell is what they're doing they are on a trip to rivendell right and presumably home again afterwards um as as was evidenced in the song that they made up um uh, for the occasion in Conspiracy Unmasked. Um, since that's the plan, under what circumstances would they go to Mordor, right? Sam would say, well, 
I would I would uh, be going that way to Mordor myself, uh, you know, if it fell to me to do the job to help Mr. Frodo, you know, get rid of this ring. That's not how Merry and Pippin are thinking, at least not Pippin, right? It's not how Pippin is thinking. How would he end up going to Mordor when he says, I hope it won't come to that? How could it come to that? Yes, it could come to that by them being appointed to go on the quest for Mount Doom. But that's not the only way it could come to that, right? It could also come to that. Um, it could also come to that. Yeah, exactly, Gilgunthir. If they get captured by the Black Riders and hauled off to Mordor, right? So, to some extent, Pippin's saying, "I hope it, going to Mordor. I hope it won't come to that." Means, I hope they don't get us and drag us off to Mordor, right? Because that's the only way I see myself going. At least that's the, right now, especially in the in the wild, surrounded by Black Riders. That's got to be on his mind, right? that the number one reason for going to Mordor that Pippin can see is in the clutches of the Black Riders, or exactly in a sack on the black of a, on, on the back of a Black Rider's steed. Exactly, Gilgonthir. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, um, um, that's, that's, I think, one thing that we can be thinking of there. Um, so, uh, when he says, I hope it won't come to that, I don't think that we should be reading that as like, you know, boy, I hope they don't lay that quest upon us, right? Uh, that would suck if they asked us to go to Mordor. Um, I don't think that that's what he's thinking, because I think that's totally not on... It's on Sam's radar screen. It's not on Pippin's radar screen. Um, I think going to Mordor to Pippin means being captured. Um, and Lincoln, absolutely. It is really cool to remember that Pippin is going to go to the gates of Mordor, right? In fact, if anybody is going to uh, sort of recapitulate the March of Gilgalad, it's going to be Pippin, right? There with the Alliance going to the to, to, to the field of Daggerlad, right? To attack the Black Gates, right? He's totally like doing a little mini Gilgalad thing right there, right? Um, he's not Gilgalad exactly. It's not an exact parallel. And yet he's the one... Uh, you know, yes, yeah, Sam is going to end up doing combat on the slopes of Mount Doom, but uh, it's going to be Pippin, in a sense, who is also sort of recapitulating that. So, um, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. The the very last alliance, JJ, does include a dwarf and a hobbit as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, um, so yes, and Galandar, you're absolutely right. We we will see Pippin's attitude changing when they get to more to not to Mortar, when they get to Rivendell. And 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 we'll definitely look at that. We'll definitely uh, um we'll definitely follow that as we get there. Um Okay, good. Um Excellent. Um And yet, Matt, they did promise to stick to Frodo through thick and thin. Uh, to the bitter end uh, back at Crick Hollow. Yes, the issue. So it's not their commitment to Frodo that is necessarily less, you know, significantly lesser than Sam's. Um, it's their understanding of what it's going to mean to stick to Frodo through thick and thin. And Sam has a uh, has a uh, uh, what will turn out to be a more accurate sense of what's um, of what's involved there. OK, All right. last thing on this slide, which I knew it's going to take forever to talk about Um uh, do not speak that name so loudly. Um, exactly, Tony. Tony was making sure I didn't forget to talk about that. Here we see a difference, right? Before when Strider said, uh, do not say such things, um, it seemed to be about rebuking Frodo's attitude or the underlying attitude of, you know, entertaining the idea that he's going to eventually, or, you know, even joking about the fact that it is his destiny eventually to become a wraith, whatever he thinks about it, right? Right. Don't even let yourself go there, Frodo. Um, uh, here, this is different, right? This is do not speak that name so loudly. Because if you speak it loudly, others might hear it. And if they hear it, you'll attract their attention. That's definitely how this sounds. I would not say such things if I were you. Sort of, for Thalus. Not exactly the same. I don't think that Strider and Prince Humperdinck mean precisely the same thing uh, in these moments. But... Um, Tony, I don't know if we can exactly say that, um, uh, I don't think that we could exactly say that, um, 
there's a taboo on the name of Mordor exactly? Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Um, the fact that Strider does not only say, um, do not speak that name, but says, do not speak that name so loudly, suggests that it is being overheard that he's concerned of. If you say that name loud enough, it might attract people's attention. Um, so I... Uh, that logically seems to follow from his emphasis on the volume with which they're saying it, right? Um, the land does have ears, Katriana. Um, we know that there are spies around. Um, and so we don't really know. I We know so little. Uh, there's so many things in this chapter that we know very little about, in fact. Um uh, but I do think that Strider seems to be concerned that their presence will be betrayed to the Black Riders if they say the name Mordor loudly. Whether that means there's some kind of way in which they, the Black Riders themselves, are sort of attuned to that, that if you say the name Mordor loudly, you will draw their attention and they will zoom in, you know, uh, you know zoom in on you and 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 follow you is it, i don't know if that's what he's suggesting or if he's suggesting that there are spies around um you know kind of like uh, uh kind of like mr beaver suggests in the beginning of the line the witch in the wardrobe right that like you know some of the trees are on their side um and uh you know and and that if they say you know if if they say if they talk about mordor then that's going to get back to the black riders and therefore, the Black Riders are going to know that they are that these are, in fact, the hobbits that they're looking for. Um, and Cecilia, I agree. I don't think it's actually taboo. I think if it were actually taboo, we would see him never saying it. And we do not see Aragorn never saying the word Mordor. Right. He said it, as Cecilia points out, back in Prancing Pony. Right. From Mordor, Barlamin. They come from Mordor. Right. So there, he does not feel that there's a taboo. Uh, on uh, on the name, and yet uh, he doesn't want it said loudly here. So all in all, I, I think if I had to guess, um, I agree, Valori, that words and names have power, but I'm not sure what kind of power they have or wherein the power lies exactly. Um, Lincoln says uh, he thinks that in Tolkien's world, just the invocation of evil has power that can attract evil. Possibly, possibly. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. My first temptation here as is usually the case is to say let's hold off on this collect some more data and revisit this right um because you know this is one data point um can we put this together with other passages like this and see what happens um uh yeah and matt i agree there are some distinctions that we need to uh that we need to make between naming something like giving something a name um as when uh, you name some when like gildor names frodo elf friend right um that's one kind of thing and that's not the same thing that that's not the kind of thing that's going on here that strider's talking about and as matt says repeating a name is one thing uh as well so i mean like to say someone's name um uh three times Sorry, you know what I'm doing in my head right now? I never realized something. I went through our entire discussion earlier without realizing this. Tom Bombadil, the barrow, the verse that he taught them to sing, invokes his name three times, doesn't it? Ho Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo, 
by water, wood, and hill, by the reed and willow, by fire, sun, and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. Yes, indeed. That is naming Tom Bombadil three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. Why? Why have I never noticed that? Holy cow! Uh, but that's a big deal. Like saying some saying someone's name three times is a big deal. Um, uh, you know, in in traditional lore, no reason to think that that's not a big deal in Tolkien's world. Um, but uh, but that doesn't necessarily seem like Strider doesn't say. Don't say that two more times, right? He just says, don't say that so loudly. The so loudly thing suggests to me that he's afraid of its being overheard. So if I had to guess, based on this one piece of data here, I would say um, that it's about being overheard. It's about spies that he's worrying about. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of you guys are mentioning uh, Beetlejuice, the, the Michael Keaton movie, Beetlejuice. Yeah, well, that's, I mean... That's a very traditional idea. They, they did not get made up for that film. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that's a traditional fairy tale thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, boy, how did I never, um, uh, how did I never, uh, realize that or never comment on that? That's ridiculous. Okay. Um, JJ is asking, were they just talking too loudly? Or did Pippin just scream, going to Mordor? Yeah, I think he might have done, actually. Right? I could imagine uh, uh, no, cried is the verb that he uses, right? I never thought I should be going that way myself. Going to Mordor? He could easily have said that pretty loud. Like, you know, the rest of them are speaking in relatively hushed voices. And he says, going to Mordor relatively loudly. Right. Uh, and uh, which if there were some kind of spy of some sort who would be reporting to the Black Riders nearby, that somebody could perk up when they heard that. Um, uh, quite possibly. Okay. We're pretty much out of time, but I'm going to do a second slide on principle <laughs> because I feel bad only doing one slide. Um, we are taking way longer. On, I think we're going to set a record on chapter 11, actually. I don't, I don't think I think we're going to take longer on chapter 11 than we've ever done. Um, OK, it was already midday when they drew near the southern end of the path and saw before them in the pale, clear light of the October sun, a gray green bank leading up like a bridge onto the northward slope of the hill. They decided to make for the top at once, while the daylight was broad. Concealment was no longer possible, and they could only hope that no enemy or spy was observing them. Nothing was to be seen moving on the hill. If Gandalf was anywhere about, there was no sign of him. On the western flank of Weathertop they found a sheltered hollow, at the bottom of which there was a bowl-shaped dell with grassy sides. There they left Sam and Pippin with the pony and their packs and luggage. The other three went on. After half an hour's plodding climb, Sam Strider, sorry, reached the crown of the hill. Frodo and Mary followed, tired and breathless. The last slope had been steep and rocky. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> JJ says soon we'll be spending several weeks per slide. Uh, you know, can't rule it out. Can't rule it out, especially as we make connections back. We have more to make connections backwards to. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are going to take a while at Aaron Tree, Mike. There's no two ways about that. Um, <laughs> Karina says, I don't mean to snark, but are there dells that aren't roughly bowl shaped? Well, I mean, there might be oblong dells, right? But, uh, I think here he's just sort of, you know, identifying it and then also helping us to sort of, uh, imagine it, right? Um, uh, yeah, just to, just to sort of help us, uh, help us picture it. Um, notice that he describes the way that he, uh, the way that he describes Weathertop is very bare, right? Um, he, he, he describes the hill as, as, you know, there, there's not a, there's not really a path up to the top. You notice, um, you know, they're, they're climbing up a steep and rocky slope on the way up. Um, they, they're, 
is a, a rough crown on the old hill's head, as Strider said, as far as ruins are concerned. Um, but it seems to be relatively low. It's high enough for them to duck down behind, but even the hobbits have to duck down, right, um, uh, in order to get behind it. So, um, uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Druid's Fire says that uh, the Oblong Dells uh, is the name of a Hobbit emo band. <laughs> Possibly so. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so, uh, everything is is after all of the the kind of the ruins that we've seen in the the rocks that are set up and everything um it's very it's the the the, the sense of openness and exposure right um concealment was no longer possible and there's that sense of um of openness around everything that they uh uh that they that they are doing here um they're following a gray green bank, which leads up like a bridge onto the northward slope of the hill. Right. So they're, they're having been sheltered behind walls of rocks and everything. Now they're, uh, they're out in, in plain to be seen from every side as well as from the top of the hill. Right. Um, all they can do is hope that no enemy or spy was observing them. Right. This is clearly very risky. They can't see anything moving on the hill. Again, the fact that they think that they would, if there were anything up there shows how open the top of the hill is right it's not wooded there aren't lots of bushes up there there's not tall ruins um it's it's you know if anything is up there you would expect to be able to see it um yeah yeah um if gandalf was anywhere about there was no sign of him um right like, he's not up at the top of the hill waving his arms at them, right? But I guess, again, it's this sense of of the sort of the openness of all of the terrain that they're around, right? Like, if Gandalf were here, they should be able to see him. There's not too many, um, there's not too many places uh, 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 to hide. This sheltered hollow, therefore, is important, right? Um, uh, this bowl-shaped dell with grassy sides, which sounds cute, right? It sounds small and cozy. It's not defensible, exactly. I mean, they're in the bottom of a bowl, right? So it's not like it's got walls and a narrow entrance that you can defend or something like that. Um, but at least it's out of it's out of sight, uh, out of direct sight, like, right? They're not just sort of exposed to everybody's view. Um, and the other three go on right away, right? They decide to... Uh, uh, to go straight up the hill right away while there is still daylight, right? They want to, they want to, they want to see, you know, if, if they're going to do it, they want to, they want to go up there where they can see around, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, exactly, Matt. I do think the difference between noon and midday as it comes in here is referring to the, referring to the location, to the, position of the sun instead of by the clock yeah um yeah good okay we will join them at the top of weathertop uh next well in a fortnight right because i won't be here next week um so i'm gonna be off i'm on vacation with my family next week which is very exciting uh i will be um up in uh prince edward island in canada actually we're driving up to canada um so uh, I will be uh, uh, I will be hanging out quietly for a week, mostly off the internet and uh, uh, and not far from Green Gables. Uh, and I, but I will see you guys in two weeks. Um, and uh, and then we'll be back. And we were gonna we're gonna power through the end of chapter eleven, uh, pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thanks everybody. Um, and, uh, yeah, JJ, a bunch of people have suggested a Prince Edward Island moot. It would sure be a fun kind of destination moot, uh, to have it's so beautiful there. Um, but, um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. I think we could do it. I just don't know how many people would actually make it out to Prince Edward Island. Um, but, um, uh, Gable moot is a little bit tempting. 
uh, uh, JJ, yeah. Uh, we also uh, uh, I joked about calling it uh, 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 Maud Moot uh, for uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, we will. Uh, I will see you guys. I'll see you guys in two weeks when I'm back, uh, and I hope you guys have a good fortnight. So I'm we are going to do a field trip now. So I'm going to switch. I'm saying goodbye to the folks on uh, to the folks on Twitter, uh, and I will say. Uh, goodbye to uh, uh, to those of you who aren't going to stick around with us uh, for our field trip where we're going to keep exploring uh, the Lone Lands uh, and see some of the places, uh, some of the gaps uh, that uh, the game is filling in and some of the, uh, the, the extrapolations that they're making, which I think are really, really interesting in the Lone Lands. So, all right, cool. Um, yeah. Trifle, I know. Power through chapter 11 with still Baron and Luthien to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's going to be interesting. Uh, it's possibly my favorite of all of Tolkien's short poems, actually. Uh, so that's going to be that's going to be hard. But um, we'll get there. We'll get there anyway. So good night to Twitter folks. And I will see you guys if I can hit the X. There we go. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. See, somebody has their snow bunny already. Yes, yes, I saw that. I saw that here. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. For for some reason, my uh, my Mac wants to. I I got a new microphone, and my it, it wants to have the the intake the input level volume level way slow on this microphone for some reason i don't know why mm. okay i'm good my levels are better now right. i think well yeah i was enjoying all the the beetlejuice and multiple three name summonings yes kind of thing on that one that was interesting it's an I, old fairy thing think- yeah, no, I, I do remember that from a lot of fairy folk tales, like, you know, Rumpelstiltskin and, you know, the ones about fairies by lakes and, and having to sing for their attention, that sort of thing. Right. I yeah. was thinking, though, about Bilbo teaching Sam his letters. Mm-hmm. Bilbo has zero patience for people <laughs> he does not like, including family members. So, like, and even people he likes, he just sort of... You just ruthlessly scalds all the time with his words. The fact that he wanted to sit down and teach, you know, the gardener's son his letters and that he stuck with it. And Sam is now, you know, a literate worded man is a testament to just how amenable Sam is. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He, um, uh, and it's interesting because there's only really one truly solid piece of evidence about the affection that Bilbo has for Sam. Right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk about Sam very much. Um, but the one thing is of course, his giving Sam the present of gold, uh, in case he, uh, wants to go get married. Right. Um, yeah. So the fact that he, uh, which shows, you know, there's something that's very, um, uh, sort of treating him like a patron in a sense, right? Like, you know, as your sort of sponsor in a sense, right? I'm going to give you one last sort of piece of patronage, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it's also very personal, right? To not only because, and especially the way in which he has, Bilbo has less reason than any of the other hobbits to know about Sam's desire to get married, right? Um, Yeah. Of course, it does turn out that Sam does, in fact, have active plans, right? That there was, uh, oh, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. he he uh, he 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 left behind uh, a Hobbit lass who had been waiting for him to propose any day, right? Um, mm-hmm. But there's literally there's almost no way that Bilbo could really know that. Maybe Frodo covered that when they're talking about Shire gossip and he, you know, put it together and remembered it. But even that, or even, maybe this is something that's been long standing. Like even when Bilbo went away, possibly, <laughs> like, maybe he's and, still pining after that girl. You've been after for <laughs> right, since exactly. you were right. three years old. <laughs> right. Possibly. Uh, and, you know, or, and, or maybe it's just simply kind of his own intuition about, you know, that Sam's the marrying kind and, and this is yeah. probably going to, happens but wh- whichever of those things it is it really does show a kind of very personal attention um 
uh, mm-hmm. to and, and sort of interest in uh, 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 Sam that I think. But again, it's really, as I say, the only part that I can think of um, where he is um, or where Bilbo shows that kind of special uh, treatment of uh, of Sam. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway. OK. All right. So Lone Lance, you guys ready to head out? I think we're yes. going to ride there as before. We're going to the we're going to we're going to. Let's go meet up by the forbidden, uh, the forsaken inn, not the forbidden inn. No one's forbidden it. You don't really need to forbid it uh, because it's so run down that most people don't want to go there anyway. So uh, why bother the forbidding it? The avoided inn. Yeah, the avoided uh, inn. No, right the, yeah. Um, the God forsaken inn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I see a couple of you are, are uh, uh, comparing ages of uh of the hobbits and yes it is an interesting fact that sam uh is the oldest of the th- i mean frodo of course is significantly older than the rest of them i mean he's uh he's a, you know a dozen years older uh than uh, everybody else but sam is the second oldest um he's uh he's he's 38 mary is 36 pippin is 28 um so uh so yeah it is interesting that Sam is is he's 10 years older than Pippin. Uh-huh. Um so uh although you know he will sort of speak sort of deferentially to him and call him Mr. Pippin. Um yeah. He still is significantly older. Um yeah. The timeline, it's like, was, was Sam possibly shown any deference because he and Frodo made good playmates? You know, that was something that was often, you hear that in a lot of, you know, Edwardian and Victorian books about, you know, the the, the only child of the house becoming friends with the son of the her father's most trusted servant kind of thing, right. like Mr. Darcy. Like I was just thinking of Mr. Darcy and Mr. Wickham, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, very possibly, very possibly. Um <clears throat> Though actually, uh, that's a good. <laughs> Sorry, I was just about to utter the sentence. Um, that's an interesting comparison between Mister Wickham and Sam. Now that's it. Now, now there's a comparison I've not, never not made. Not the later before. years, yeah, but um, certainly the younger. But uh, but but yeah. Though of course, if you think about the difference there, think about the uh, the kind of distinction that old Mister Darcy is said to have shown to Mister Wickham, right? Uh, raising him like a gentleman. Essentially, paying even for though, his education, yes, and paying for his education, and 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 him going to school with Mister Darcy, right, with young Mister Darcy, um, yeah, uh, as well. So, treating treating them as if they were, uh, you know, socially as if they were equals. Um, now, part of this, of course, is you know one of the factors that's very different here is that Sam is from a very working class background, um, uh-huh. uh, whereas old Mister Wickham was seems to have been a gentleman who fell on hard times right uh and became the yes. steward of mr darcy um as sort of an act of pity by old mr darcy um for a you know a friend who had come down in the world uh whereas mm-hmm. you know hamfast gambling the allowed charity yeah exactly whereas whereas this is not the situation, right? You know, the Ganges yeah, no, were not I am gentlemen. Yeah, no, salt of the earth kind of thing. Absolutely. From, and it, from, from and the it is interesting that it is interesting that from what we know, Bilbo and Frodo didn't seem to have any other household servants. Like Gardner was seen, esteemed almost as great an office as a butler. We, right, exactly. And they don't, there doesn't, that doesn't seem, I don't know. Do we have any evidence that that's a thing? That they have servants? They have butlers and maids and things? I mean, that I, maybe they do, but even in even in Buckland, you know, even at Brandy Hall, they mostly mm-hmm. just have family, you know, all over the place. I suppose if you have a big enough family, you don't need butlers. <laughs> exactly. Who needs a who who, who needs a, a servants when you've got you know Reggie over there when you've right? got a hundred <laughs> relations in the place? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, but but it, it is interesting. I mean, uh, Sam Sam's relationship to Frodo, of course, is you know very much that of servant, um, and you know, of course, you know this has been something that's been commented on, of course, many many times over the years. Um, very much like a Batman, uh, you know, ballet, yeah, to an officer um, uh, in the war. 
I loved the comment, brother. I saw it go by on the Twitch chat a while back uh, when they were sort of talking about uh, a Batman and what a Batman is. And, and I loved the comment uh, that somebody made that uh, Alfred was Batman's Batman, um, which is exactly oh, correct. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> exactly oh, correct. Mind blown. Yeah. Right now, now as as uh, uh, as Trifle points out here, uh, Sam was going to Buckland to do for Mister Frodo and see to his bit of garden. The doing for so Mister Frodo is to be his manservant. Yeah. Oh, so it's, that was almost like a like a promotion, but it is interesting. It's a smaller house, and he, that's not what he did at Bag End. Yeah, I mean, does he do for Mister Frodo at Bag End too? Or, I mean, is he would or he? Is there a woman who comes in once a week and does it? What? Right, you know who would uh, you know who would who would very likely be, you know yeah I don't know um, uh, yeah I'm not really sure exactly how to describe Sam's role I mean again servant general yeah sure but but again like is there a staff you know does Frodo have a staff um, is well there Frodo- might be other Gamgees we do know Sam has a lot of brothers and sisters maybe you know like one does the washing up and you know the other one comes on and does windows some days you know yeah who knows yeah um yeah I yeah I just I'm not really sure it seems also possible that Frodo and Bilbo as bachelors wouldn't have a significant staff right uh-huh. Um, they would, uh, they might have somebody who comes in to clean or something like that. Um, but, um, yeah. Oh, interesting yeah. point. Uh, 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 Ferith says one data point might be that in the Hobbit, uh, Bilbo is expected to dust his own mantelpiece. Yes. Not to mention do his own dishes and those of his guests. Oh, uh, uh, yep. There um, we are. Uh, and cook for himself, right? You know, he cooks better than he cooks um, uh, and offers to cook a dinner for the trolls. So he's clearly not, you know, he doesn't, he does not pay a cook, right? He doesn't have a cook on staff. Um, I think that'd be sacrilege among hobbits. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, just personal point of pride, you know? Right, right. Cooking, you mean specifically. Yes. Yeah. Yes, cooking specifically, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder. Tony says, "I wonder if uh, Angelica Baggins comes in every other Tuesday or something like that." Maybe, maybe. I mean, it could be a family thing. Um, again, Melly Lott comes in and dusts thinking. the mirrors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Melly Lott. Yeah, yeah. Uh, possibly, possibly. Um, but it's certainly, we certainly don't get a sense of like that. There is a large staff of servants off in the background. I mean, I really don't think. Uh, I really don't think that that's the case. And Belong's Mond, I think, is right to say, what does this, what does servant mean in the Shire society exactly? Um, I don't think that we can see glimpses of the whole kind of upstairs, downstairs mentality, right? Um, mm-hmm. But it's not really well defined. You it's know? not fleshed out. There's not so much of a class divide. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's almost like the literacy, you know, meaning him no harm, of course, not to get big ideas. It's almost like a less of a stepping above his station, more as a filling his head with stuff that's absolutely unimportant in life. Right, exactly. And I mean, there, there is that sense of, of their betters, right? I mean, so it, it's not that there is not, we, you know, that that kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, class distinction is, is not made. It clearly is made by the gaffer. Um, mm-hmm. And yet, yet, yeah, we don't see... Uh, we don't see people who are in service, right? In the same way that we have, again, thinking of the upstairs, you know, the whole upstairs downstairs situation uh, in it English culture. Seem- yeah, it almost seems to be divided between those who own the land and who work the land. Just as simple as that, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, the um, landowners and the tenants. Yeah, belongs asks. But we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would would a traditional servant a, a traditional British servant, uh, throw an apple at Bill Fernie. Um, it would depend on the stat, uh, on the station of Bill Fernie, right? Um, if, uh, uh, like, uh, he wouldn't throw an apple in the face of like one of the brandy bucks or something, probably. Um, but 
I I think that he uh, he. Could, but then again, see again here. This is where I think that trying to project those kinds of traditional class distinctions back into the text don't always work perfectly, right? Because you'd think, yes. all right, if if Sam thinks of himself as a traditional English servant, um, mm-hmm. uh, not you know not putting himself above his position and and remembering his place when he's with his betters. Um, Classically, right, a classic uh, example of his better would be Lotho Sackville Baggins, right? Lotho Sackville Baggins is clearly Sam's better, socially speaking. And Uh yet Sam speaks quite openly of wishing to punch his pimply face, right? Oh, even Mary and Pippin, you know, it's like if, if in tra- proper English society, Mary and Pippin and Frodo would be up at the front, Sam would be at the back, and he would not be allowed to comment on anything anyone had said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't be his place to take part in a conversation. Right, right. So, yeah. they, this is a far more egalitarian society. Yeah, it is. And uh, uh, Matt said he pointed this out a little while back, but um, that... Um, uh, there is some precedent for you know a wealthy bachelor having only a having only a manservant. Um, uh, two examples: uh, one that he points out to right away uh, is uh, uh, Algernon in uh, Oscar Wilde's *The Importance of Being Earnest*, uh, who only oh, has yes. Lane, his his manservant. The other that I would point to uh, would be Lord Peter Whimsey uh, and Bunter. Um, from uh, Dorothy Sayers' Lord Peter Whimsey Mysteries, um, written right around the same time as Tolkien was operating. Um, and, you know, there again... Mr. Norrell and Childermas. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Childermas, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. So, yeah, Jeeves and, Wo- and Wooster, absolutely, right. Yeah. So that, that, <laughs> That's my favorite. That kind of, I mean, Jeeves is hardly a typical example of a manservant, right? But, um, uh, but yeah, that, so that idea that a bachelor without a, a proper establishment of his own, you know, who uh, has, no fa- has no wife and no children and, and therefore does no real, uh, um, uh, uh, you know... Um, um, and uses three rooms of his mansion. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bruce Wayne and Alfred, exactly as Tony is, is saying. So yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, Bruce, you're absolutely right that um, Sam saying he wanted to punch Lotho's pimply face uh, is after the quest. Um, when Sam has already been kind of elevated, and it's possible that maybe he wouldn't have spoken openly of wanting to punch Lotho Pimple's pimply face um, uh, before his perspective had been widened. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, anyway, let's. Um, however, I'm getting kind of distracted. Yeah, so. here. But this is a really <laughs> interesting question. So let's. But let's explore. Let's explore. So yeah, let's explore. Um, looking at the map. We can see that we are just to the north here. So the part of the uh, uh, of this section of the map uh, that is in the book, right, is Weathertop. We were looking at the path that they took down to Weathertop, and then they get to Weathertop, and then they're going to leave Weathertop, and they're going to be paralleling the road. Uh, as we're going to see, we'll 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 try to follow their. Um, uh, their progress, and then of course we're going to get to the last bridge in the game. Obviously, as you guys know, the last bridge here is the boundary uh, between the Lone Lands and the Trollshaws. Um, so we'll see them do that, but they stick relatively close to the road, and we don't hear much at all apart from those descriptions in the Hobbit that describe the ruins that they can see off in the distance and stuff. We know there are a bunch of ru- evil-looking ruins who look like they that look like they were built by evil people. Um, we don't know much else about it. So, of course, they have put in a bunch of ruins uh, in this uh, in this area, and of course, we like looking at ruins. One of the things, of course, that we have been observing <laughs> routinely about ruins as we've gone through is, of course, the way in which uh, Lotro uses the ruins and all of the older things that they see to show, to suggest the underlying history of this part of Middle-earth, and in particular of course, uh, the Kingdom of Arnor, uh, which was close to here and those, the, 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 the kind of memories of the king that the land holds, right, even though the people have kind of mostly forgotten the king, uh, which I think is fun. Um, but uh, let's... Uh, but let's go. This uh, I I have always loved the name here, uh, uh, Minas Ariel. 
um, which I think must, I, I, which I think I, I would translate the Tower of Dreams, um, ah. which I think is really interesting. I know Ariel. Oh, sorry. Here, I got to introduce myself to this uh, stable master. Either darling or really creepy. What do you mean? Yeah, it's very interesting. So I can't wait to see what the uh, Tower of Dreams was all about. <laughs> Um, Ariel is, of course, the name of the original narrator figure from the Book of Lost Tales. Um, oh. The original conception, of course, of the Book of Lost Tales, the original Silmarillion stories, being uh-huh. that a human man had ended up at Tolaresia among the elves and was, um, um, uh, you know, met the elves and heard from them the stories, uh, not only of their own history, that is the elves' own history, um, but of the Valar and the creation of the world and all these things. So he's gaining all of this lore. Sorry, just looking down into this dell here. Okay. Um, and then, um, so he, he's learned all this lore and he's going to bring it back. So, of course, the, the, the conceit is that the book that you're reading is, of course, ultimately derived from the, the, the record uh, that Ariel uh, received. And, and Ariel's name, and that's exactly how it's spelled, exactly uh, as Minas Ariel is in the, in the, in the game here. Um, the, uh, the name is translated by Tolkien as He Who Dreams Alone. Um, and yes, it's spelled E R I O L. That's exactly how he spells it in the book of lost tales. Um, now eventually before he abandons the book of lost tales, he is going to change the name of the narrator figure. He's going to change it from Ariel, he, uh, one who dreams alone to Alf winner, um, elf friend, uh-huh, uh, yeah. uh, with a different history. Almost, elf. Almost Alfred. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Alf, uh, of course, meaning elf, uh, and being very important. So, um, Anyhow, uh, so uh, the, the, the so this is why I, I assume that uh, uh, the, the, uh, Minas Ariel sounds like Tower of Dreams, which I agree uh, is a very mythic sounding name, Bruce. That's uh, uh, it's I, I've always really liked that uh, in the game. Um, and Tony, yeah, I'm often reminded of the Dreamer in the Tower of Pearl as well. I don't think there's a Tower of Pearl here, but um, it's. Um, it's pretty cool. Mostly well, rock in here. Yeah. So the first thing that we see, of course, is yes, indeed, Minas Ariel seems to have been an Arnorian stronghold. So just in case we <laughs> might have been thinking uh, that we're um, um, that we are uh, uh, moving on to some different kind of because uh, there was no, no, I'm not. Rem- it's been so long since I've played the Lone Lands. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, Valor, if you remember or if uh, uh, someone else could remind us. We hear stories about this place in the Forsaken Inn, right? When we're given yes. quests to come here. Uh-huh. What's the background of this place that we're told of? What, what things do we learn in the inn at first? It's been so long I can barely remember them. Because there was some kind of God. mystery, uh, some kind of uh, dark, if not secret, sort of tradition but yeah, these are super standard Arnorian ruins so far. Yeah, actually, I don't Ooh. remember. I seem to recall at this point in the games when I start skipping over dialogue boxes. So. Aha! Uh-huh. It's a it's a sin of mine. Uh, um, sorry, I was noticing this. Uh, this is. We have not seen very many examples of this kind of concentric defense. Yeah, right? this especially is that a, taller that tower in the back is almost utterly alien to what we've seen. Yeah, this is a highly defended position, and then yeah, you're right. That is very different. A, What's on top? It's a big of sort it? of. It's a pyramid, and I see. Wow, that one's got a uh, little crenellations crenellations on it. Is that the word? Yeah, it does have Gosh. crenellations. Crenellations are that's unusual. We don't see crenellations usually in our Norian no. architecture. No. What's the pointy bit at the top of that tower? The sort of... It looks like it's, it's got something statue. on the statue. Yeah, I think it's another relief of one of the kings like we see down here farther down. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I think it's a relief depicting a king. I can believe that. 
Hard to tell from here. Yeah, a little odd to have that up on top of it because it's really hard to tell. I mean, like a relief is a weird thing to put at the top of a tower. You'd think it's <gasps> statue. Also, these be. bridges are really funky. I mean, somebody took a long time to make sure these bridges were as dangerous as possible. Yeah, yeah, the bridges are a little bit... Um, it's not going to pass OSHA at all. <laughs> railings, more railings. What are these, elves? Come on. We need railings. Yeah, the railings, the lack of railings. Yeah, I, I can see it. It's a it's a winged helmet king on top of... In, in winged helmet ca- king. Oh, carved right. in relief on the top of the tower. All right, I'm coming over. Hang on, I'm also dismounting. Forget horse ri- yeah. horseback riding around here. I can, I can afford. Yeah, at least, it, I can at least you're not ride. on a war steed in here. Yeah, <laughs> can you imagine trying to ride a war oh, steed man, on these. No, no, I could not. All right, <laughs> Hang on. I'm being very careful. I can better afford to walk than I can afford to fall off. Yes, I see. Because it's exactly, in fact, up on top is exactly what's the same as underneath. Mm-hmm. The only yep. difference is that it's not... We've never seen anything like that not set back against a wall. Yeah. This one's freestanding. Yeah, that's weird. And, oh, there's lots of little reliefs underneath that sort of pyramid structure with the stars and the scepter. Wait, where? Uh, near the bottom, under the near along the side, near the first relief on the part of the tower that looks like nothing we've ever seen, really. On this same structure? Yes, on the same structure. On the side of the tower, there's a tall um, sort of gothic arch and two gothic arches on either side of it. And those are um, other reliefs of, or images this, of kings. On the side of on the, the side, tower? Where I'm standing, where I'm standing. Okay, over here. All right. All right, coming over here. Coming over here and looking. Oh. Oh. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've seen those on any Arnorian buildings yet. Five? Really? Uh-huh. Five. One yeah. central, and so like one central person, and then four like mini-me's on either side. Yeah. Or like two on either side, four total. Yes. <laughs> I love this goblin standing here with us. Just... Which we are, what are we looking at? It's just... <laughs> huh. Five, though. Mm-hmm. Well, there might be five more on the other side. Mm-hmm. Right. But I would expect that to be a repetition rather than additive. You know, rather than actually representing ten uh, of them. It's, it's the tallest point. Too bad we can't get on this bank and get a 360 view. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting, though, because why should there be five? I mean, I can't think of any reason for five. Maybe a king and four sons? Right, but what king had four sons? I don't know. You know... Maybe four heirs, not four sons. Maybe they're nephews or something. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, you know what this place is saying to me? The word I would use to describe the overall layout of this, um, the overall layout of this uh, uh, whole city or whatever it was, is paranoia. Yeah, um, it's like the Winchester House. Yeah, so got the- doors. Doors leading nowhere, ramps going, and no place in particular. Wall here, wall there. Right. But the thing is, if you look at it, so over by the gate where we came in, the first thing that I was noticing is the concentric defenses, right? We have two walls with gates inside, right? So that you can, you have multiple lines of defense on the way in. That's actually been very unusual in the Arnorian structures that we've seen. And Uh then... You come inside there, and then you immediately get stairs. Even though there's perfectly level gr- ground going on, like there's no need for bridges or anything, and yet we uh-huh. have these, you know, stairs which come in and come around, and then back up onto this narrow ledge, right? So it's like if you imagine somebody attacking, 
from over there, right? And they break their, yeah. they not only have to fight through both of those gates, then they have to fight their way up the stairs and up these other stairs and then over around this ledge. Because if they go down there, then you're still safe up here and you can still escape across, you know, the way and down over the other way, right? Or if, uh, or if. Yeah, and these four way intersections that are clearly meant to, you know, make it so armies have to travel single file and be picked off. Right, exactly. And where we were standing before, when I was looking at this other archway, the one that I was just, this other bridge, the one that I was just near, um, if you look down under it, over here, uh, look at the little spindly pillars that are holding that thing up. It's like you could then flee across and collapse that bridge after you, right? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, it is... It's like the Winchester house. It's, it was designed to keep everything trapped in, including the spirits of those who wanted you dead. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, I um, um, I was. Uh, it just it, th this whole thing. I mean, it doesn't necessarily look. I mean, it's not like a mastermind, uh, you know, sort of concentric uh, defense. But I mean, it really. This place would be very difficult to. Yeah, this 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 place would be difficult to overrun, uh, you know, even by a large army. I like notice even these kind of intermediate walls, right? So if they came in, you know, down here to the ground level, look, they're still fo forced to another choke point here, right? Yeah. And then you get through that, and what do you get? Oh, look, another choke point in order to get to a narrow bridge. The, the fact that none of it makes any sense speaks to the power of the person doing this overriding common sense. This is a person who had enough money to say, I don't care if it doesn't make sense. Make it happen. Right. And uh, you oh, know, and we got spooky metal thing on top here. On yeah. top of this four-way intersection. That's what I was just looking at. I'm trying a, not to back off the, the bridge oh, as I... That's second revival in Marm... Old, or, Angmarim, I think. Oh, is it? Is it an Angmarim I, spike up there? I think so. It's got the sort of uh, Art Deco designs on the side. Huh. You can't see it as well. When you back up, it's that distressing pinkish, purplish, greenish color we get. Yeah. Well, it certainly Octarine doesn't look like it fits it with the stone, and good. And certainly, I don't recall seeing any spike like that. And of course, well, I it, noticed the sky got all dark. Yeah, that was the, that, that. That's that's the first suggestion that there's let's see where's the boundary of the of the shadow there yeah i know i got back up a bit don't you make you work for it it. It, it it didn't just turn to night did it uh no it suddenly oh it here we go it takes a while to dispel oh right yeah here okay, it is over here where i am it's dispelled yeah here it's and bright yeah you can yeah you got those uh sort of art deco carvings in it and yeah, it doesn't have like the bladed sort of fish hook things, right? No, it's not a fish hook. It is that weird yeah. metal, but it's not a shape we've seen. This place is just nuts. Yeah. The place of dreams reminds me. Did you ever hear about uh, how they excavated the city of Minos? Oh, I, I, a little bit, not very much. Uh, basically, the the guy thought that he was in touch with the spirits of the of the. Of mine of of Crete and Minos and King Minos, so he would go to sleep and and or me and meditate on the palace, and he would have dreams about places, and then he'd wake up and he'd knock down walls and destroy architectural and archaeological finds and designs to make it match his dreams. Right. That's kind of what this place kind of feels like and looks like. It looks like he just woke up one morning going, we need a spindly bridge over there now. I know it doesn't go anywhere, just do it. That central thing does look important, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it's sort of the weather vane for the whole thing. Yeah. And, of course, down in the, down in the chasm, we can see there are spiders all over the place. Spiders. Probably drawn here by the evil energy... As right, because there is there is definitely evil energy, and I agree that that obelisk on the top of that tower, which is not native there, right? That just does not fit. Nope, doesn't uh, match it. A... Yeah, so I agree that looks like a later addition, and certainly the theory. I'm going to approach it again and watch it get dark here, and the darkness comes on the bridge, right? Yep, there it goes just turned green, and yep. now it's dark and creepy. Yep. Um, yep. clearly as we're approaching this, um, 
Yeah, uh, Tim, it does look like a, 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 a temple, right? Like a, a, a temple to, uh, to Sauron or to the Witch King. Um, Not an actual temple. We haven't seen any of the, the resurrected, uh, well, um, you know, the, the new priests of uh, Angmar. Right, right. And here we have this, like, set of standing stones over here. But this looks like it was just a, you know, so like this is like where the, I don't know, where you'd set up your, button. yeah, exactly. This is where you'd set up your grill for, you know, afternoon parties, right? This is not a, a shrine over here. To lure the enemy away with delicious food. Yeah. And then knock over the bridge. <laughs> This is really this place where now this obelisk stands, which makes everything creepy. And there's these those the only markings I can see are these like four arches mm -hmm. on this side. <laughs> like a breezeway. Yeah. Don't get it. But anyway, so whatever this place is, this place seems to be the center. Um like the point to which you could retreat from almost any side, you know, from almost any angle here. Maybe cast some sort of spell to protect yourself. I don't know. Or maybe it's all leading up to the tower. Maybe these are all things that feed into the tower. Man, it looks really spooky over there. I want to go over where the goblins are currently living. <laughs> yeah. Because they're clearly, there used to be one of those spindly oh, bridges yeah. here. Right? So... Yeah. But instead, we have to go over the goblin rope bridge, which is fun. Yeah, this is or goblin orc made. Oh, yeah. creepy torches. Here we go. Creepy blue, green torches. Piles uh, of skulls. Tasteful skulls, right? Uh, uh, Any um, pelvis fires? A must-have in all go goblin architecture. A goblin shrine, right? To the little goblin deities with the burning goblin face up at the top, right? Wow. Like, I am the god of the goblins. Do not write, you know, so that's all fine. Um, we've seen those kinds of things many times before. Um, Magmag, destroyer of tea time. Be yeah. follower of potable drinking water. Big old tower. I can't really tell what it was for. It was Aha, kind of and that's what I was seeing from a distance, of course, is that we do have a, a white factory ah. over here. Yeah, there we go. A phylactery factory. <laughs> oh, another goblin shrine there. <laughs> They're freaking adorable. <laughs> they are. I want Whoa. one. Of, that's another one. I want it in my house. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Okay, so over here, here's where the factory is. And we got the bones here, right? So we got the raw materials. Yep, we yep, got yep. the. Ghostly fairy lights, big yeah. rock with slashes on it. That's right. Which kind of looks like a hand, but probably isn't. A <laughs> dark satanic mill. Yeah. Ah, a tasteful uh, skeleton so in a hanging cage. Familiar little f archway over here. Does this one got a metal dealy on top? or I, I don't know if I can see, back up for it. Oh, and another white factory over here. I, I don't see around. a metal dealy on top, but I can't back up far enough. No obelisk, yeah. I'm not sure the atmosphere here will let me see it. Yeah, I can't get a good enough look at the no, top. No, there's definitely not. I'm 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 up on a, a hill to the south of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can. I mean, I think we we would be able to see it if it were sticking up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it better here. So we see only the traditional. Um, you know, the stuff that we've seen elsewhere, the white factories, the goblin shrines. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, who's this fellow standing right next to me? What is this? That's a thunderstorm from the picnic. Is it? It's oh, summer. It's thunderstorm? There's thunderstorms everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, okay. See, Katrina, I don't think that that can be the white hand in the white in the in the white factory, which I'm trying to make some distinction in those two words. Um, Wait, because right, because they are uh, because the 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 white factories are clearly Angmarim, not mm -hmm. uh, 
Not Sarman. Saramonic, Sar- yeah. Sarmonic? Saramaniac. Saramaniac, yeah. They're not, now, I guess if you're a follower of Saruman, then you're a Saramaniac. <laughs> Whereas Saramonic. I finally, I finally coined a weird word for this. That's it. That's good. I like that. <laughs> that Are you, in package. fact, a Saramaniac? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, that's uh, another t shirt I gotta make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> oh great now i got maniac from flash dance stuck in my head yeah yeah summer maniac, maniac. <laughs> okay i hadn't made that connection yet but now that seems in- in- inescapable um okay let's see people are saying it looks like there's some kind of faint image on the wall i see it don't know what it is you know what it looks like? It looks like the design that's on Gondorian doorways. Is what it mm. reminds me of. Except it's Not sure. sort of faintly... Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell whether we're just projecting onto a, 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 a texture pattern that's been overlaid on the object. So. It could just be... Uh, it could just be uh, uh, lichen, in fact. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me light up one of these guys. Okay. Um, all right. So this place is also under corruption, right? What was the point of this place to begin with is what I'm trying to figure out. I'm not seeing any big bad we're supposed to defeat out here. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking from an Arnorian standpoint, like when they built this place, was this... Well, because it's clear that that place with the obelisk on it now was the hub, right? Yeah. So and can I just say, when I, was, the there? when I was when I was low level, I can't even describe how much time I spent kiting huge numbers of mobs around in circles while I tried to find my way the heck out of this place. Oh, um, yeah. But, um, yeah. Oh, and then forget falling down among the spiders. Like, five goblins oh. and wargs on my trail, and then I... I oh, yeah, and I, then I, in the spiders. I Rivendell and then the 14. bridge, and then, yeah, you're down amongst yeah. the huge spiders and everything. Um, You're trying to kite him around a wall and then discover a spider web is blocking your path. Yeah. Yeah. Oh look and there's there's Rivendell. Good times. Or not Rivendell, there's Weathertop right off right over there. Weathertop. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. And then what was this? Like the Arnorian Coliseum over here? Is there a door? Yeah, there is a door. Yeah, here we go. What do we have in here? Throne room. Yeah, what, like audience chamber? Uh, There's some sort of stone here indicating that this is some sort of plaque or dedication. Something was written on this. Uh huh. Right, clearly Arnorian with the stars. Mm hmm. And we've got this, the three kings here. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I, I, I forget. Sorry. Somebody was... Um, uh, who was... Somebody... Uh, uh, Trifle. Trifle was pointing out that Isildur had four sons. So maybe the five that we were looking at over there. If these... Anytime we see three in a row with the stars around their heads like this. I'm always assuming it's, you know, Oendo, Isildur, and Inarian. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, the five could well, if the five, the four small with the one prominent big in the middle certainly could well be Isildur and his four sons. I think it's a really good theory. Yeah, so, that's a good one. The, if the, one thing strikes me about this room, if this was a closed-in audience, there was no windows or anything to give no. any sort of light. What I'm trying to see if there's any hint of is roof. I don't see any broken pieces of dome. This, 
Was this tower is pretty broken, though. Yeah. Could this have been open to the sky? audience chamber if you couldn't be there in the rain. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's the open air look. That's a doozy of a tower up there. That's almost as big as some of the stuff we see out in Green Greenfield and yeah, the one behind us. Greenfield, um, uh, at Greenway the Tower and oh yeah. Oh, that one's got like uh, the tree emblem on it. Yes, that's what I was just looking at. We saw that before. That tr- in Bree. Yes. Right? That uh, sort of blasted weird tree thing. Twisted white tree. Well, and it, it, that tree is similar to the tree they actually have in Minas Tirith. So I kind of like how they're doing it their way. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, right. It's possible. Sorry, I was just looking at... Um, uh, uh, Trifle was also suggesting that these three... Uh, instead of being Elendil, Isildur, and Inarion, could possibly be like the three sons of Isildur who died at the Battle of Gladden Fields. Possibly. Mm. Possibly. Volandil's dead brothers, yes. Um, yeah. Interesting. Nope, oh, running out of time, but let's see. Yeah. Okay, if I've kept my bearings, and in this place it is not at all guaranteed that I have, this <laughs> over here leads to... Okay, right, isn't that the hill that there's a person up on that took me forever to find out that there was a person up there? Um, there's a person up there? One of these has. Uh, that, that girl you're supposed to rescue. Um, yeah. She was cool. I'm not sh- <laughs> uh, more look more same thing you come across the bridge through a gate and you're in a courtyard with more walls and another choke point i mean i get uh, paranoia right i mean it's just like this whole place yeah is one it doesn't make sense. Well, it, it, it does make sense if your primary purpose is to it's like prevent yourself defense. from being yeah, exactly, from being overrun. Um with the constant you know, narrow bridges and choke points and now labyrinthine but, Oh look, a little little goblin totem here. And the ooh, okay. Here is a single Oh, a goblin just blew me up. Um, a single king here, and the tombs. Ah. No, I'm lost in the labyrinth. All right, here we go. He's got a crown, a pointy crown, and uh, what is that? A sword, a bow, a horn? Well, it's across his pelvis there. That looks like a bow, actually. It does kind of look like a bow. That's not one we've seen. We usually see him with a sword. Yeah, holding a sword down the length of him. Uh-huh. Interesting. Huh. Still got a crown, though. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, pointy crown. Which does not look yes. all that much like the Iron Crown. Yeah, the, which we can see right there. So More crenellations on that tower over there. And there's the... Yeah, see that? The tower with the crenellations on top have, yeah, the, have the five kings uh-huh. underneath them. They look newer, too. Yeah. Or just sort of added on later. Hmm. Fun. Interesting. And then we've got this like whole ziggurat thing over here. <laughs> so it 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 was said that Frodo felt that these were built by wicked men. Now they, you know, the question is, did they feel the sort of the residue from everything, or are we sensing that the sort of Arnorian thing was re- built by a guy who was a couple of sardines short of a can? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, I think that, uh, 
It's one of the things I'm going to be interested to look at as we explore the Lone Lands to see if there's any distinction that's made. Um, uh, is, uh, you know, that um, this is obviously Arnorian through and through. Like, there's nothing here that's not Arnorian with the possible exception yes. of the obelisk uh, on the center thing there. But as far as the, the building is concerned, right? Um, yes. There is no reason to think that this place was constructed by wicked men. Are we going to no. see others? You know, other examples of things is, you know, maybe this wasn't what Bilbo was looking at, you know, um, and indeed it would have been off the line uh, for either one of them, for Frodo or Bilbo, uh, to see this. Um, so, um, uh, and my other question is would this place be like this and still be standing at the time of the last alliance in Weathertop and when the the fortress on Weathertop was still standing. Hmm. Yeah, it would have to be there when the fortress on Weathertop was there. Mm -hmm. My question is not whether it would have still been here at the last alliance, but whether it would have been built yet at the time of the last alliance. Yeah. Uh. I'm not sure which is in worse condition, honestly. <laughs> right. Well, and you know, things like, you know, the, the crinolations came afterwards with the with the the four and the one. Maybe maybe this is from an earlier part of Arnor and a lot all the Isildur stuff was uh, added later. Right, maybe. Maybe. Huh. Oh, okay. And was and was it this crazy? <laughs> right, right. Very interesting. Well, yeah. and we've seen no indication of where the name of this whole place, Minas Ariel, came from. Uh, necessarily. Um, but let's see if I remember correctly. This is the exit right over here. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, there we are. Is that the... Yeah, we've got the encampment over here. Yeah, the encampment, and then we keep going. We get to the Lorne span. Yes. Yeah, oh, and there's a great view of Weathertop from here. Oh, and yeah. once again, as we find... As we will find pretty much everywhere in the Lone Lands, we are fully in the view of... Weathertop, wherever we go. Mm. Which is cool. I, I, I can see why Aragorn would say, you know, don't say the name out loud. It definitely gives you a feeling that you're being watched all yeah, the time. Yeah, that there are spies all around. Whether there are or not, we don't know. But anyway, yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, we'll keep ruin hunting and maybe we'll actually get to, we'll go up Weathertop itself uh, next <laughs> time. Uh, maybe we'll actually do enough slides to uh, get to the top of Weathertop, which I think we are. We have them climbing the hill. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll get to explore Weathertop next time. And then we'll continue looking around the ruins here and seeing the story that we have. This is quite, quite a complex uh, here complex perhaps in more than one sense uh of uh which is clearly arthedanian in 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 its roots so we'll see what we can see as far as uh the layout of the rest of the things here when we continue to explore all right thanks everybody for joining me uh and um we will uh we will resume in two weeks uh after i get back from canada so thanks everybody and I will see you guys in two weeks. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.